I met a gypsy. We good. All right, Jaleek Swole. We are doing it, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, exactly. Yeah, pr- now it's been it's been a long time coming, dude. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Yeah, no, nah, same, man. I uh, I definitely. Um, so the, actually, the, the first time I ever heard about you was through Roger Larson. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Roger. Um, and then Wes Williams was a real big Jalik Swole fan too when you were on uh, on mini bikes. Mm-hmm. So I've kind of always mm-hmm. been a bit of a Jalik fan. And then I feel like this year, obviously breakout year for you. Um, and I feel like there's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of really uh, new Jalik Swole fans out there as a as a result of uh, of the the carry on this year that took place. Yeah, yeah. No, I. Uh yeah i mean had a really good season and um yeah i mean we're we're just getting started so um obviously you know i wish i could have done more and finished out the season i got hurt in ironman but um yeah yeah, i mean i think for a year or two i think it's pretty good i mean i know a lot of people don't even really get to achieve a lot of stuff that i already achieved this year and um so i'm just super grateful honestly and uh yeah it just comes from all the hard work down at you know bakes yeah man no it was definitely uh i mean you look at the field that you're in in this 250 class like it's probably as stacked as it's ever been but i feel like that's pretty much just like the new normal now and i think that it's uh Mm -hmm. it definitely takes like real talent um to to get any you know like a podium or a win um in that class nowadays yeah, you don't luck into, uh, you know, any spot on the box as of right now. Like, everybody's good. We're all super um, close in speed, and that's why, like, you see all the time qualifying. Like, we're all within tenths and hundreds and all that kind of stuff. Like, honestly, hitting a turn just a little bit quicker will put you from, you know, top 10 to 15. So, um yeah i mean the field is is stacked but um man it makes it makes it for fun you know what i mean i mean we're all we're all pretty close and the racing's good and uh yeah i mean that i wouldn't really have it any other way so um i think the class is in a good spot right now especially going into the future yeah man i I definitely don't think it's gonna be any easier ever like and you you know you look at the way Mm -hmm that um teams are investing in amateurs earlier and earlier um it just seems like it just guarantees this ridiculous amount of depth in the 250 class and it's it's pretty crazy man like it is sink or swim um and it you know there must have felt like a bit of pressure on your end to come in and you know like really quickly adjust really quickly try and figure it out and then try and get like some podiums and wins like you did so that you can actually solidify a spot because I mean, how many times have we seen guys come in, do a couple years, um, and then they're gone? Like, I mean, Matt Bashalia kind of comes to mind there as maybe like one of the recent dudes that like wins a Horizon mm-hmm. Award, and then it's just you know a couple years on Geico, and then you're kind of gone if you don't you know put in the results. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, you know, that's stressful for any rider coming up. You know what I mean in the off season, and you have your contract up and. Uh, especially for me being so young and the, the pro scene, like, you know, it's, it's almost like trying to figure out what even meets that criteria of yeah. like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm going to get signed again. You know what I mean? And for me, I just felt like, uh, I went into this season just really like, I was like, okay, you know, um, I've done everything, you know, I needed to do like preparation going forward, all I can do. And I'm just going to have fun and create memories. And if it's my last year, it's my last year. You know what I mean? Uh, it was a hell of a ride and I had fun, you know what I mean? And, um, it just so happened that like I started clicking off pretty much right away. Like Orlando, I mean, I missed, I missed a rhythm and got passed for third by March Banks and ended up fourth. But like, that was my best, you know, finish ever. And it was just like, at that time, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it was just funny cause it was just a complete switch in mindset and like just wanting to have fun again. And then all of a sudden, like I started really clicking off like little things I wanted to do throughout the season. And, uh, I think that was one of the biggest things to how good I did this season, to be honest with you, was just like 
every single race I had so much fun and like I know that's like that's what every rider says oh I had so much fun you know um but like I really did like my team was like backing me and everything was like we weren't we were taking it serious but we were keeping yeah like the reasons we came into this sport you know what I mean yeah it's so 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 easy to forget that dude like i remember um mm-hmm. when i was around jdr and we were going to uh all the races and you know doing the supercross and the outdoors and you kind of you get in that grind and it's like every thursday you're getting on a flight and then you know you kind of on the way you've got you get done with the weekend and then you deal with the flight home it's like it it definitely is hard mm-hmm. to have fun at times and then if the results aren't going your way or if there's any kind of morale in the team that that dips down and i mean i remember like pj larson you know like i never really saw him have that much fun um you know the the guys mm-hmm. that uh well and, you know the guys that were on the team at the time like there's just so much pressure the schedule's crazy and mm-hmm. it's pretty easy to lose sight of you know the the fun element of it mm-hmm yeah it's easy to get caught up into it i mean and it comes from like no racer out there right now is not training so mm. you know what i mean you put in your hours and hours except and stank hours dog. like dedicating your whole life <laughs> except stank dog he's an exception though you know what i mean that's that's his character but uh you know what i mean like everybody does all these different things to get to where they want to be and then they have their races where they're not doing so good it's easy to get into that funnel of just like oh man am i am i good enough and yeah. am i doing the right things and and those types of things creeping into your mind will set you back far and it's like the mental aspect of the sport is is i feel like it's not even talked about enough like it's honestly yeah. about 80 percent of your racing to be completely honest with you if you go up to the line knowing that you don't really need to be there (laughs) it's gonna show you know so i think a lot of it's just mentality and um i mean you see you've seen guys have bad years and come back and do big things all the time so i i think it's just the people who are kind i don't want to say the weak but in lack of better words you know what i mean it's like it's it separates weak from strong in a way you know what i mean i feel like the mentally weak don't really last very long out here oh man i completely agree and i mean i'm 33 so i'm a bit older um than you and the thing that i guess i would have learned in the time between like your age and now my age is that your mental fortitude and your mentality is basically everything that you have in your life like you can you know every situation Mm -hmm. that you get presented there's a there's a myriad of ways that you can look at that exact same situation and uh there's one like kind of I, i always go back to this um this kind of thought experiment of you've got two identical twin brothers right and you say to them both like they do you go you've got to do 50 deadlifts of this weight now they're identical brothers one one guy Mm -hmm. is gonna look at those weights and go like oh fuck yeah i work out all the time this is dope i know this is gonna suck Mm -hmm. but like i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna be sore but then when i'm sore tomorrow my legs are gonna like then they're gonna grow and i'll get stronger and then you could have the exact the next identical twin that looks at that same weight does the same thing as like fuck this i don't want to do it i'm not gonna be able to work walk tomorrow Mm -hmm. my back's gonna be sore the whole day that i'm sitting at work it's this they're the same body the same everything and the Mm -hmm. mindset is different so it's like i try and apply that to everything in life is like what's the other way that you Mm -hmm. could look at that if i had a twin brother that thought you know the exact opposite like if i'm thinking negative like what's the positive way to look at this and uh man that's that's definitely been like because how old are you now uh, i just turned 20 yeah i mean dude if i like for you to say that it's 80 percent mental at 20 years old like fuck that took me a long time to to figure that out you know but mm-hmm. that, i really really think that's the case and that's sort of one of the big priorities in my life these days is like trying to become like mentally a mm-hmm. savage yeah no i and i think uh I think I would dedicate most of that just to my rookie season. Like, I feel like I've experienced so many ups and downs already that, uh, 
that it kind of just it set the way for where I'm at now in a way you know what I mean like I I, I was I felt like I was at the lowest of lows my rookie season and honestly me training myself to like re rethink how I was in amateurs like in amateurs like I had I had some really good competition but I, I went up into the line like thinking you know what I mean like I'm gonna get the whole shot and I'm gonna win yeah and so I had to like put myself back into that same mindset of when I was just in B class or A class or whatever and just that that type of thought process and training myself to like believe again like really put me to where I'm at now because I had some pretty bad races where you know what I mean whether it's my fault or not I went down and had a really bad performance after having a good moto and those are easily like things that happen over race days where you could just put yourself down super quick Mm. and this year I was like I felt like so like seasoned you know what I mean like in a ways where like I took the licks and I was like you know what I'm ready for next weekend so that's I felt like that was like the biggest thing for me is just like mentally training more so than like riding yeah what what was uh what was it about that rookie season that was so tough dude i mean for one as a racer you know what i mean you you feel like you should be doing a lot better than what you are doesn't matter Mm. if you're winning or not you always pick off something that you think you can do better and my rookie season like dude i i didn't have like my debut was was terrible right like i went in qualifying bad in qualifying uh went to the heat race got a good start rode pretty well but crashed in the whoops uh had to go back because my bars were mangled <laughs> dead last gate pick in the lcq didn't make it through the lcq like yeah, it was that's as bad it was, as it gets dude i just felt yeah like i just felt like i experienced so much in one year like i just that was like the lowest of lows as a dirt bike rider right like you didn't make the main you didn't do anything like you didn't live up to what you're supposed to live up to and whether that was you know my fault or not like that that's the perception of it like you didn't do what you're supposed to do you're kind of written off from that point you know what i mean and uh i mean after that like i finished multiple nights and whatever but like it's just like and then and then also built into it like you see other rookies and other coasts doing so well yeah and then like you know what i mean you start to compare yourself and do little like back to doing the mental thing it's like you mentally shoot yeah. yourself in the foot in a way yeah. so i'm like comparing myself to other guys doing good and instead of just worrying about myself and it just put me in a place where I'm like, dude, I'm not, I'm not like, I can't even, I I can't do what I'm supposed to do. Like, you know, I'm not the guy. There's people beat me that I I was beating. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? And then, you know what I mean? You put on a front when you go and you practice and like you have your practice days and you're like, Oh, okay. I'm starting to feel better. Go to the race and then don't do good in the race. And then you're back in the dumpster. So like, that's it. Like, it was just a bunch of that in my rookie season. Yeah, I had a couple of good races as a rookie, but like it was just more downs than ups. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's so hard, I think, because the the way that the industry has been for the last few years, it's like everybody's looking mm-hmm. for the Villapoto. Everybody's looking for the Dungey. Every, yeah. Like the expectation of being a rookie is like, oh, you just go do what Villapoto did. And then you win three lights titles mm-hmm. and then you win four 450 titles and then you retire and ride off into the sunset. And it's like, that's kind mm-hmm. of, we've, we've just lived through this insane era of, you know, these guys that have just mm-hmm. come and completely dominated uh, from their rookie season onwards. You know, you go like Stuart, uh, Carmichael, then you go Stuart and then you go Villo, Dunge. Like we've had, that's like a fucking 15 year span of these guys that just like come in, mm-hmm. they show up, they blow up, they take all the cash and then they dip. Yep. And it's just like, yep. it's kind of hard because yeah, I mean, you're comparing yourself to what those guys did, but also that's what the industry is doing. The industry wants that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So like, you know what I mean? And all riders aren't oblivious. Like we know that's the expectation. So 
um, yeah, you, I mean, you try to live up to that and then it doesn't work out and then you're just, you're just there. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, it, it does suck in a way because, you know, a lot of guys, I feel like are just, they come in and then they're rushed out so quick that, dude, they, they might be the next guy to win a yeah. few championships. You never know because they didn't get that shot. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just grateful that I had a good season enough to where they were like, oh, okay, yeah, this kid like has something, you know what I mean? That we can work with. So I'm just happy to have my shot back and, uh, yeah, man, but it does suck. I mean, so you see a lot of guys and you said Bichelia earlier. So like it, it's, it's so many different names that like you can yeah. literally think back and be like, oh wow, that, that guy raced in, you know what I mean? Like you start to forget because of how fast we're pushed in and how yeah. fast we're pushed out. So honestly, I mean, it, it does suck, but in the sport, I mean, it's sink or swim and you yeah. have to do what you got to do. And if not, you're out. Oh man, for sure. And, and but you know, perfect example is you got Dylan Schwartz and Cody Shock. You know, you got these mm-hmm. two privateer mm-hmm. dudes that are, you know, they're obscure guys. They're not guys that have been considered for factory rides in the past. And, you know, they've found a way mm-hmm. to grind and, and, and make it happen. So, I mean, I don't know, hopefully the, I guess the industry will just change as time goes on because I just don't know that we're going to be able yeah. to get those guys. Like even you look at Jet, like, I mean, you know, you've, you've mm-hmm. raced the guy like that's a really talented dirt yeah. bike rider. And I mean, he ain't winning every mm-hmm. single moto and he ain't, you know, like he just yeah. won the title and, uh, you know, he would mm-hmm. be considered like one of those kind of talents. And it's like, even for him, that's considered in that way. Like it was not easy to win that shit. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, I mean, that's just, it's just a testament to like what you were saying earlier about how deep the class is, you know I mean? Um, you know, he is what everybody says, a generational talent, right? And and he is really talented on a dirt bike. And, you know what I mean? Like you said, he doesn't win all the races. And that's because literally everybody's putting yeah. in almost the same amount of hours, the same amount of work. And everybody is like dedicating, you know what yeah. I mean? And that just, it just shows. I mean, everybody, like, what, what was it? It was like seven different winners this season or whatever in outdoors or something like that. Like, it's just, we're, we're all right there. And, uh, it also shows like, you know what I mean? Someone who can be a top dog one weekend, get a bad start. And then all of a sudden yeah. completely flipped, you know what I mean? And I just think, I just think we're all, we're all right there and we're all fast and we're all fit and it just goes to show like a start is pretty much everything in a 250 class right now because we're all on it yeah dude for sure so uh where do you go like what's the well you dip into when you need to you know learn more about that mental fortitude or you need more uh like knowledge about the mind and the power of the mind like where are you going to to dip into that kind of uh or like where are you looking to for resources for that kind of stuff um honestly i felt like i've always been in a way better off although i did have my struggles in rookie season i feel like i've always been better off and you know throughout my rookie year we had that stint where this that was covid time right so covid came in and it stopped everything and we weren't doing anything for you know whatever amount of months but i I really just like found myself within that time in a way yeah. like I, I just I don't know what it was about just like the peace and quiet of not even having to worry about riding a dirt bike anymore it was literally just like you you worry about yourself in a way you know what I mean and I had that time and it was just like the peace and quiet and just like just like re-innovating myself in a way just like yeah staying calm and just all that kind of stuff. I just feel like we get so caught up in racing all the time. Like we forget like normal aspects of life. And then like, I start to just kind of like rethink about just my whole life and like how it's gone down and everything that I've been through and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I just like learned to just be like, you know what, this shit is nothing compared to what I've been through. And then ever since I got that kind of mindset, like, dude, I've been, I've been so good this year with it, like been completely fine and honestly unfazed on a lot of stuff that I feel like would have, would have put me down and you know, the last year or 
just any other racer out there to be honest that's so rad man and and that's like kind of the best thing about <laughs> hardship you know and I, and I think that uh, like i said as i've gotten older i've tried to mm. lean into like whatever the hardest road i can take is within reason you know what i mean like you want to work smarter yeah. not yeah. harder but you know there's times i think especially in like my own training and and my own riding and stuff like that i mean there's kind of these lanes in your life where like you can really push yourself and really take the hard route you know mm -hmm. like on the last lap of a 30 minute moto in florida when it's 100 yeah. i mean you can cruise to try and mm -hmm. you know keep within the range of that yeah. lap time or you can really try and drop the fucking hammer you know last lap of that mm -hmm. second moto that you're doing and, and try and be the man and then that that it's like those little wins are the things that you kind of go yeah. back and and mm -hmm. lean on when when shit does get tough mm -hmm. now it's funny you said that because that's that's one of the things in the outdoor season that like we were working on early on was like i was a good guy through 20 minute mark to 25 minute mark and then obviously fatigue and the work or whatever would get to you and then your lap times drop off a second or two seconds or whatever and that was one of the biggest things like alden and uh Mike Brown would get on to me about was just try to get those like set those little goals and achieve those little goals and it was funny you said the last lap thing because that was that was one of the things like you see the two lap card or the one lap to go or whatever and you just try to lay it all out and mm. it is what it is you know and uh it's just funny because we were working on that kind of stuff over the season and it's funny you brought that up but yeah, yeah I, I mean that that's everything setting those little goals and and achieving and then it just it builds and builds and builds until you know you're at your tip top shape or whatever case you want to be at you know yeah and i think that uh that just becomes like this uh like we sort of said with like that whole weightlifting thing you know like it's just perspective like it's just the way that you know mm -hmm. the way that you look at it and uh like for me i raced a race a few i guess it'd be over a month ago now and um it was the last race of or well, second last race of the day for me and we're going down a fast sort of whooped out sandy straight and a dude just like swapped right in front of me and i hit this guy wide open like i didn't even have time like i was trying to pass the dude and i didn't even have time to shut off the throttle man and i just hit this guy went flying over the handlebars and i you know when you're in the air and you like you know you're gonna get hurt and I fucking yeah. hit the, uh, mm -hmm. dude hit the ground and I've been struggling <laughs> with my shoulders for, for like the last year and then my shoulders are just completely mm -hmm. cooked now and uh, and you know like mm -hmm. I feel like the old me like I, I still by the end of, like I still was like drinking beers with the boys and I was like having the best time <laughs> after, even though like I knew I wasn't going to be able to ride or train for probably a while yeah. uh, but the yeah. my mentality around it was like when i the last injury i had it forced me to like learn a lot about myself and my hips and how you you know hip mm -hmm. mobility works and mm -hmm. flexibility and now like i'm a way better physical person because of the adversity like because of that injury i learned a lot about yeah. myself mm -hmm. and then i'm like oh that actually wasn't that bad like yeah it took like nine months to fix it but i'm now better for it yeah. and then that was just the thought mm -hmm. i had about my shoulders i was like oh well i guess i'll just learn about this and i'll do mobility and i'm sure i'll be better at the end of it so yeah it's all like the more shit that you go through in your life and overcome it's like mm -hmm. practice you know like you just get better at overcoming shit yeah you just you start to i feel like the more stuff you go through the more you realize like not everything is such a huge deal in a way yeah. you know what i mean yeah. and like like you said, you know what I mean? You had your injuries and you had to take your step back and like as cliche as it sounds, like taking a step back is, is almost as good as anything sometimes, yeah. you know? And I think that was what I had to do. I had to take a step back to build myself up and then be a better person going forward. And, um, yeah, I mean, time off always helps, you know what I mean? Especially when you can just like relax and just think about, whatever you know what I mean and everybody's different and you know how they mentally prepare for something or uh however that goes you know what I mean but um yeah I always think like if you, as bad as it sounds you know you know but when you have an injury it helps you in in most cases then it, it does hurt you you know what I mean I think you get smarter uh and you just start to think about 
you know, the little things and everything that makes you appreciate what you're doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably, that's one of the things that, you know, just even from talking for this first little bit is like, you ob- you're like yeah. obviously a super grateful dude, you know, like you figured out pretty young that like gratitude is the right attitude, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, but I mean, I was also raised in a, in a household that was like that, you know what I mean? We didn't really have much growing up and uh, that was just one of the things that like my mom and my dad always told me was like just always be in the moment and be grateful for what you have and especially just like the stories that my mom and my dad would tell me of just growing up because they didn't have anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you just, I feel like I, I have had like, I have so many family members who come from backgrounds of struggle that like honestly none of this shit really like phases me you know what I mean in a way and uh I'm just like literally just grateful to be here like I I literally love what I do I come to the track and uh, I do best when I'm when I'm having fun and I'm smiling and I'm joking with you know the whole team and and just like fucking around but I'm serious you know what I mean and like yeah just that that fun makes me uh makes me a better person and a better rider and you know what i mean it's just it's just a better way to carry yourself throughout life in general really you know what i mean and um i just feel like you know all that all that little stuff is just made me who i am today you know what i mean that's that's kind of what i'm getting to the gist of is like yeah a, a lot of a lot of people put too much thought into little things you know what i mean yeah so let's talk a bit about the, the, I guess, like your upbringing, because that's one thing that, I mean, yeah. people have told me for so long, like, you got to have Jalik on. He's got the craziest story. And, and I mean, even over there, like mm-hmm. when, you know, I'm hanging out with Roger, he's like, dude, Jalik is like the coolest kid. So everyone's kind of, everyone yeah. that like knows you and knows that your story and what you've been through is mm-hmm. always seeing your praises. So I guess like, Let's yeah. just go all the way back to the start. Like, I want to know how the fuck you got in that chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, dude, I mean, it's almost like a where do you start kind of story. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't even I don't even know where to start, honestly. I mean, I grew up, didn't really have anything. You know, lived in uh, a trailer park, like, with my dad and my mom and... Uh, and then we, you know, we went from a trailer park to a not so good neighborhood and, and like all those little things until we were able to, you know, get a decent living, you know what I mean? And, and get into an actual house and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I started ra- racing when I was five and, um, yeah, honestly, we, we just, we just didn't have anything. Honestly, we just, we went to the track and we were struggling and, um, my mom didn't ever really understand it. And I think just off my dad wanting me to be something, you know what I mean? Because he yeah. never really had the chance to do anything when he was a kid. And, um, he pushed me like super hard just so I could have a decent living for myself. And also, so I wouldn't go down the path that he was going down and like, he just did everything he could to steer me away from everything that was around me at that point, whether it was, you know, like the kids in the neighborhood or, um, just whatever, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, I just, I wouldn't be here without my mom or my dad, you know, they sacrificed literally everything for me to be here. And dude, it's like, I don't know. You would just have to, you just be straightforward me and ask me something and and I'll tell you about it because dude, I could like, I could talk all day about, all like my life so so where where did you grow up like so what town were you born in uh ocala florida and bellevue but i I claim bellevue so where is that in relation to that is mm, uh i would i mean i I would just say it's gainesville kind of yeah do you know know what gainesville is yeah 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 so i would just kind of claim that um, in a way, like I was only, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes away from Minio's. Yep. So, yep. um, kind of in that type of area. And, and so were your parents super young when they had you? Yeah. Um, my mom is 
30 something right now so i guess it's pretty young right i'm 21 or 20 so yeah yeah yeah, i mean pretty young i i I don't even i don't know the age that they they had me but i know that they were they were younger they were younger parents yeah and so what were your what were your parents doing um at the time because i mean (laughs) so i i guess i can i can kind of visualize like uh Florida like kind of those neighborhoods you know like in the like you said you kind of first mm-hmm. grew up in a trail park like I've kind of been around and seen mm-hmm. some of that area and kind of what it looks like I mean I'm kind of thinking about when you sort of drive through like Dade City kind of deal and you kind of get on the outskirts mm. of, of that um yeah. so well, yeah, yeah what you go you? on the outskirts of Dade City you'll kind of see what it's yeah. like in a way kind of not not too much of them of the magnitude but you you see the like the gist of it a little bit yeah 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 so and so Uh, what were your what were your parents doing back then so my mom was she would work as a uh she would draw blood at the prison um for like women and stuff like that so she would uh yeah draw blood and then my dad would he would pick up work with uh, his mom on a like cell phone business or something like that. Like he would do, um, I don't, I want to say it's where those guys climb the cell phone towers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. What, what, do you, what would you call that? Yeah. I don't know. Like a maintenance kind of dude or something. Like I have no town. idea. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But would climb the cell phone towers and that's what he would do. Yeah, right. And so I guess, like, what are some of your first memories? Like, do you remember kind of growing up, um, like, being in the trailers sort of deal? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was just, like, the normal life of anyone struggling, you know what I mean? Like, not, like, you know what I mean? There wasn't, there wasn't much food going around. There wasn't, it wasn't much of anything, you know? But I would always stay outside and try to, like, hang out with my friends and stuff to just kind of stay away from that whole kind of deal. You know what I mean? Anything you can do to get away from that kind of life is, is what you do. You know what I mean? When you're in that situation and I would always be gone and, um, just hang out with my friends or at my grandmom's house or whatever. And, um, that's just what I did. I would always be at family members, houses or whatever until I was around, I think maybe, 12 or 13 and that's when uh my mom and dad like threw threw together as much money as they could and then we went to uh I went out to Georgia um close to MTF and I trained with the Bells do you remember the Bells yeah 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 so I I trained with uh Zach and Chase up there and uh they were like my second family until I moved to Ferries yeah sick so uh i was with chase i did the shoot with chase in hawaii oh nice i yeah it's funny because i was i was at his house then yeah. when they went out there and uh yeah it's funny because i remember him coming back and was all super stoked about how sick it was and then i remember him always throwing it in my face like the scrubs and shit on the yeah. youtube video he's like oh, you can't do that kind of shit yeah but yeah, yeah no it's funny i i uh i seen all that stuff you guys had mookie yeah. chase and it was Keisha. another australian kid right Keisha. Yeah, yeah 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 no so yeah i know those boys pretty mm-hmm. well and then uh and then i think when my dad <laughs> went over do you remember jackson richardson when jats was over there racing aussie kid i know the name but i i don't i don't have a face to it yeah so he would go and train at the bells a little bit so like my dad's been over i've actually Mm -hmm. haven't been to the bells place um but yeah my dad's been Mm -hmm. over there a bunch so they're the fucking nicest people man oh no yeah they they took me in when i was like small too because my obviously my dad would have to go back and, and work and everything and i would I would literally just like live at their house until we got, you know, whatever a motorhome or like a, a little tiny cabin that I could stay in. So, yeah, I used to live with uh, Zach and Chase at their house, and uh, yeah, they. That's why I'm saying like they're my second family because they just like practically raised me. Like I, I, I literally just like I would come back home and my mom and dad would be like, "Why are you acting like that?" Like I, I was just acting like like them. You know what I mean? I was literally like like a little brother you know what i mean so it's uh it's funny that like you're you're kind of 
around in a way you yeah, know what i mean yeah, it's funny yeah. it's just like life comes in full circles you know yeah 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 and that's what i'm saying like i i yeah knew about you fucking years and years and years ago like everyone would talk about how cool you were yeah uh, yeah dude i was i was one of those kids that like i was around zach and chase so much and and that was that was honestly a pretty big age range i feel like because they were like four or five years older than me and i was just a little kid so like i i grew up pretty quickly just off of being around them and mm. uh yeah i was just like i was a lot older than my age because i would always hang around just like older kids i never i never uh i never like simulated with the younger kids or the kids yeah. that were like my age so i was always around the older guys yeah yeah and it makes sense i mean even like all the like the messaging and stuff we've done like you definitely don't come across like a 20 year old kid but i think that you know going through mm. like the stuff that you described it kind of makes sense that shit forces you to grow up quick you know yeah exactly so i mean yeah i mean i stayed with the bells from to till i was maybe 15 yeah and then um that's actually this kind of the same time when I went through everything with my dad going away and um, yeah if we I really didn't even know like what I was gonna do at that time and uh, I was kind of just contemplating like giving it up and just didn't didn't really know where to go you know what I mean you know, like young kid and you don't have your dad in the picture like there's no direction you know what I mean especially I think a lot of kids will simulate to this is like you go to the races and your dad is everything you know what i mean your dad's yeah. your gate packer your dad is either your mechanic and he gets you know what i mean he's like does absolutely everything so i didn't know exactly so like i had no sense of direction and um obviously wasn't going to be able to afford to do anything and uh that's when kind of around the same time i got picked up with husky and um luckily i had uh my practice bike mechanic from then uh like my dad made him promise that you know what I mean he would make sure his kid made it and you know when he get out he would you know what I mean he would repay the favor but uh this guy I'm talking about his, his name's Brandon and his last name's actually loser but uh he would literally f fucking he would drive me to all these races all across wherever and he was like you know what I mean? He was like the older brother. I, I, you know what I mean? Like he just did yeah. everything for me. He was like a, he was like a dad too. You know what I mean? And he's honestly the only reason I feel like I, I'm really even here because without him, like the whole fairy situation probably wouldn't have even worked. And, yeah. um, he just guided me throughout that whole thing. And honestly, it was just like, I'm like that, that guy's family for life to me. And he's the reason so why I'm, I'm here really. That's so rad, yeah. man. So, Honestly, it, dude, it's such it's such a crazy run, like. Yeah. It that's what I'm saying. Like you have to ask me because, dude, there's so much stuff that yeah. like I could get into, and I just I have no direction, you know. Well, it's so it's so cool, man. Because I mean, it it is a a very unlikely success story, you know. Like, there's mm. just no black kids that even race motocross. Like, there's two other dudes that are, you know, in, well, three. There's yeah. another guy. Oh, fuck, I forget the guy's name. Um, he's got like dope dreads. He's a privateer dude on 450. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> you know I know who you're talking about. Dude, I don't. I don't remember cool the spot. name. Uh, as a Honda, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that guy. Yeah, uh, dude. This season, this season at Bud's Creek, this guy was giving me a hard time about letting me go. I guess he didn't know I raced there or whatever. He wouldn't let me. You know how they like they close the gates off so the fans can't sneak through the pits? Yeah, yeah. Right there, I was trying to get through in between motos because I was like, I need to get riding socks or something from the car. And this guy was giving me a hard time. And, and, and that guy actually came out of the blue and he's like, no, 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 he's good, he's good. And then all of a sudden I was good throughout the day. Just Dude, cycling through sick. back and forth. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck, I'm so bummed I'm spacing on his name. Anyway, shout out. He's a fucking legend. Uh, but yeah. He always like, wears a shirt that says, I'm not I'm not Stuart or not something. Stu, he says, I'm yeah, not Stuart yeah. or I'm not Malcolm. It's something yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the guy. Yeah, he's a G. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so there's like, it's not like there's, I mean, even coming from like a real low income, you know, like so socially, mm -hmm. like you pretty much come from yeah. like the lowest kind of rank that you can kind of come from in America, really. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. to do a sport that requires 
ten thousand dollar motor it's Money. a it's it's yeah it's an unlikely yeah. story you know like um do you do you remember when you first realized that you were super poor like do you remember the first like what was like the first thing that made you go like oh fuck yeah this is this ain't like i mean normal. now now looking back i do right just knowing how like everything works kind of now like figuring it out but obviously back then as a kid you don't you don't know that you know what i mean you, you only know what's in front of you so i honestly like i wouldn't have known anything i was just a kid like having fun like if my mom and dad came back from walmart with like one of those 50 dollar mongoose bikes like i was riding up and down the street all day like i didn't know any better at all and um like those little things that are like what i held on to you know what i mean because yeah. like i didn't really have anything you know and um yeah i think that's just the that's the difference between you know what i mean like kids riding right now and compared to me is like they, they've grown up and they've had they've had stuff you know what i mean so they tend to not appreciate as much as the next guy and like that's where like dude i've, all, I've like always been appreciative of what has been put in front of me and to answer your question dude yeah i i did not know that yeah. we were poor and um, the only kind of times I knew were like when we would show up to the track and I would see kids yeah. with like, uh, the, the full kit, you know what I mean? And like their bikes all done up and stuff like that. And not saying I didn't have a good bike cause I, I was perfectly fine and I was competitive once I got to like sixties or eighties. Like that's yeah. when I felt like my family was starting to be comfortable at least, you know what I mean? Like we had, yeah. we had what we needed to go racing. So yeah. I say I, we only really struggled until I was a, around the age of, you know, 13. And then, um, and then obviously it kind of shifted again when my dad went in just off of my mom trying to do whatever she could, you know? Yeah. So, um, what, what was the, the neighborhood like? So to, to give some context, I haven't really spoke about this too much, but, um, so like we, yeah. d we definitely didn't grow up with a lot of money and my mm -hmm. my parents uh <clears throat> bought this, this shit's like it's funny because langston we were talking about this and it's like you never want to like there's always people that are worse off than you right so you never want to mm -hmm. like kind of make it out like you had it harder than the next person because yeah, everyone the worst. exactly the worst, yeah. like everybody in life has their struggles and you know like my parents did the best that they could and I'm so fucking yeah. proud of my parents. I'm so grateful for the way mm -hmm. I grew up and the way that I grew up shaped who I am now. And I have a dope ass mm -hmm. life. So like I could not and would not yeah. want my life to go any other way. But I remember being yeah. a kid, like my parents, they, you know, they bought their house and it was like way out of town so that they could get like a decent, you know, block of land and all that sort of stuff. And then... Mm -hmm that area ended up being developed into like housing commission so all yeah. around mm -hmm. all around where we grew up where became like a black housing commission neighborhood so in terms of yeah. growing up and seeing how there's like good kids and there's bad kids mm -hmm. and we're in very close mm -hmm. quarters and then it's very easy <laughs> to be friends with one or two bad kids that then turns yeah. you into a bit of a you know so like i definitely uh -huh. in 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 my own little way like i can kind of understand how living in a poor neighborhood where you don't have that much like mm -hmm. do, i'm i mean i just we'd get in fights like constantly like my my whole yeah. childhood was just about like not getting fucked up by people you know like for whatever mm -hmm. reason like mm -hmm. it was just a really angry like really angry place and the people that i was around it was just mm -hmm. every day was just like basically go to school try not to get your bike stolen and try not to get into a fight mm -hmm. and that was pretty much like you know what where where we we're at and then you know shit gets better but like that's kind of what you know like what i asked before like when did you realize you were poor because i mean i definitely had times mm -hmm. growing up where like you go to school and then you see the shoes kids were wearing and then you were like, oh, yeah. fuck. Like, I didn't even know they made those shoes. Mm -hmm. Like, those, <laughs> that's pretty fucking yeah. dope. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, you kind of, <laughs> there, is, there is, like, little moments. And, again, I'm not saying that we yeah. had it, you know, fucking this yeah. isn't a poor me thing. But yeah. there are moments exactly. in your life where you look and you see around and you're like, 
oh man there's like a lot of kids that have like this kind of shit and then they all the time there's like this kid's got this kid's got another new pair of shoes and not like this kid wears yeah. like three or four different pairs yeah. of shoes a week to school yeah yeah and and i love the fact that you said like the whole appreciating thing what your parents did because i i like that's how i am and um yeah i mean it wasn't as bad in like the trailer park area i feel like i feel like everybody was kind of on their own thing you know what i mean i had some kids in the uh in that in that deal where it was like we, we were all cool and we rode our bikes and we hung out at each other's places and did whatever. And, um, that was all good. But, and then it was like when I was in a not so good area, like, did I remember I was like, I want to say maybe mm, eight or nine. I remember dude, our house got kicked in and, uh, there's like a bunch of people with masks and guns and they were just running through the whole house. And like, I remember that as a kid and, and like me and my mom being, uh, held gunpoint in the bedroom. And we were just like the, I mean, the guy was like, he wasn't anything gnarly. Like he didn't beat us up or anything. And, uh, I just remember him being like, stay right here. And he had the gun pointed at us and, uh, my mom like put a shirt over my head or whatever to try to cover it. And you know what I mean? And me, I mean, I'm scared, but like I'm a little kid. So like, I'm still kind of just like looking or peeking or whatever. And I just remember that whole thing going down and like, just like gunshots being fired at our house. And then like the cops showed up and then like, yeah, I remember like we had a German shepherd at the time and it got into one of the burglars and like the dog was like hurt and all that kind of stuff. And like, I don't know, dude, I just, I remember all that kind of stuff and like, I don't even like talking about this kind of stuff because like these, the, like the people of Modo or in the community, like they're not going to understand this or, you know what I mean? And, and I don't want to come off as I'm like, like, Oh yeah, look at me feel, I feel bad for me in a way. You know what I mean? I, I hate that. So I don't know, dude, I keep all these like stories to myself in a way. Cause it's just like not a lot of people will understand that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely get it. But I think that, um, well, for example, right? So we, we, we spoke when I posted that clip with Bogle and we were talking about the race thing mm-hmm. in, in motocross, right? Mm-hmm. And I, and we spoke because I obviously like spoke on you and I was like, hey, like I'm just letting you know this is what I spoke about. Like if you're not cool with it, then like I can mm-hmm. take it out, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I, um, I mean, dude, I got a lot of messages from black kids that, you know, and, and just like black dudes that ride bikes that – sent me a message and said like hey dude like thanks for talking about that like it is true Mm -hmm. i'm the only dude that looks like me that goes to the track and he's like it's just this thing that that no one wants to talk about and so i Mm -hmm. i actually i was talking about this um the other day and i i said i probably wish i said it a little bit different because what i said was race doesn't matter Mm -hmm. but race does matter and what i probably should have said is race doesn't matter but culture does because Mm. the race like we're the same thing we're the same we're fucking humans like there's no the you could Mm -hmm. you know you could say race and you're a different race you're black i'm white whatever right but we're the same thing but in terms of culture we don't come from the same place bro and and you can't yeah i I don't think that there's any point in kind of like putting down where you come from or these stories because Mm -hmm. that's culture bro like that's where you came from and it made you who you are and you're now this dope ass motherfucker that's winning races in the 250 class in you know one of the most stacked fields ever and it's like this is a really great part of your story and and so you know Mm -hmm. i know you don't want attention for it and you don't want accolades for it but there's kids out there that might be going through the same shit that think that they would never in mm-hmm. a million years have a chance of being a factory rider for rockstar energy Hasvana. but then they look mm-hmm. at your story and they're like holy fuck he did it he did it from where yeah. i'm from and i think that's what kind of does make it important you know so i know you don't want the mm-hmm. attention and you don't want the poor me kind of deal but there's probably some kids out there going through the same shit dude that look at you and want to be where you are and to know what you went through, yeah. it's probably going to give those people a lot of hope. 
Yeah, and I mean, when it comes down to the racing, obviously, there's no right way to talk about it, you know, like every everybody has their own opinions, and and they, you know what I mean, a lot of people are closed-minded about it, and they don't even really want to even get into it, and they consider it as uh, politics and yeah. all that kind of stuff, and I mean, I don't know, I always stayed out of that because, in a way, like, I feel like whatever I say, you know what I mean, you're going to have the other bozos talking, to, you know what I mean, just like yeah. down on it, and I really don't know any right way to talk about it other than to just, you know, be a racer and just race because, like, I just feel like the more you talk about it, I feel like people try to make problems out of it in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it it does suck. I mean, there's a bunch of kids out there who I know I'm not the only one to have, like, a crazy story upbringing and all that kind of stuff. Like, I know there's probably kids going through the same stuff that I went through and they want to do this. and, And it's hard to tell a kid they can do it when the sport is so like it's so like financial you know what I mean like you need the money to do this like you need money just to even become a racer you know what I mean and it's like it's super hard to to do that and especially when a lot of the teams like unfortunately like they don't they don't look at a kid that is getting fifth with not so good equipment they look at the kid winning with great equipment you know what I mean and that's yeah kind of always how it's been so it's like it's hard to look a kid in his eye or try to persuade a kid that no like you can do it when there's so many odds against you you know what I mean and yeah um, I think that's just one of the most difficult things about our sport is it's not it's not a basketball or a football where you know what I mean you're gonna stand out regardless if you're good you're gonna stand out you know what I mean yeah. Because you need the motor, you need the bike, you need the suspension, you need everything. You know what I mean? And um, that's just one of the parts of our sports that's hard to get over. And that that's a parent's thing. And that's why I'm so grateful for my parents sacrificing absolutely everything for me to be where I'm at. You know what I yeah. mean? Because, I mean, it, it, it sucks to say it, but, I mean, it's 90% of can your family do it yeah yeah i mean and yeah that is so true but i think uh i mean i I think there's probably like virtue or like there's probably a um there's probably something really great in telling a kid like hey it's really hard to go pro like there's a lot of luck involved Mm -hmm. and a lot of you know like you said you met your boy and then he introduced you to ferry like there's a lot of that good luck Mm -hmm. that goes into it but i think a good message you know is like hey you might not be pro dude but like this is a way to just better yourself in general. So like if you can, oh, yeah. you know, get to the, yeah, whether you go pro like or not. Motocross, like, mm-hmm. keep going. No, no, no. Like whether you go pro or not, like this is a great thing to be into, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know what I mean? Like moto, like being so focused with moto kept me away from all that other stuff. Like all the other outside noise and everything I was going through back home, it didn't really matter when I got to the track or whatever, because it was just about bettering myself and trying to get to where I wanted to go. So like, I mean, with this sport, it can, it can take you where you want to go for sure. And it can keep you away from like all the harsh realities of what you actually go through at home or life or in general, you know what I mean? When you're on the track, you're on the track and that's it. You think about that and that only. So I think motocross kept me level headed and, and like, honestly, that's why I'm, am the person today because I was so much like I, I was in a not so good time in my life and stuff. But, like, I was, in a way, like, sheltered by moto, you know what I mean, in a way, because it was just Mm. like, hey, we're going to, we're going to get you to this training facility, and you do absolutely everything you can, you do everything your trainer tells you, and that's it. So, that's what I lived in and died by, you know what I mean? I went to the track, Uh, Chuck Bell, who was uh, Zach and Chase's dad, he, he, like was like teaching me like everything as a kid you know what I mean like you know, the, like the lap times I have to get to or like the sections the motos jumping like jumping was a big problem for me when I was younger and like all those little things we went through together and and, and that being in Georgia away from Florida is like kind of what shaped me right now you know what I mean like I didn't I didn't have to you know what I mean endure anything at home or struggling yeah. as much because I was sent off and you know trying to better myself yeah and I think dude man like 
regardless of where you come from. I mean, for me, I remember being a kid and that fucking motorbike was just the thing that took me <laughs> away from all those problems. Like, cause yeah, yeah it, it was, mm-hmm. it was tough to be in like the neighborhood that we were in and surrounded by all that shit. And you know, like, you get on the the track the track and you get on the bike and it's just gone like it's just such a great escape and you become (laughs) like you become desperate to to ride and all i wanted to do was get on the track and then when i wasn't riding you know like my friends would come over to our place like that's one thing that i was so pumped on and like lucky and so grateful for is like our family was super tight so we had all the kids in the neighborhoods Mm -hmm. you know they had like fucked up families and drug dealer parents and just you know like Mm -hmm. that kind of vibe and we we had like this little hub of all the kids and we were all into moto and Mm -hmm. we all would just sit in our living room at my parents house and mum would make us food and then we'd fucking sit and watch Mm -hmm. like crusty demons and terra firma and mini warriors and yeah you know like Mm -hmm. we just lived in like exactly like you said you know like moto became this You're thing sheltered. yeah we'd just hit us from the rest of the well and then you'd run the gauntlet every time you rode your bike to school but you know you just was so yeah. pumped that you know you could get home and dad would be home from work at 4 30 and we'd have the mm-hmm. bikes loaded up and then we'd try and go ride and and that and it became like a reason not to do drugs and a reason not to party and mm. a reason not to get into fights yeah. and a reason not to steal cars and do all the shit that everyone uh-huh. else was doing. Yeah. And that was, and that was one of those things with me too, is like a, a lot of those kids that were like that for you, uh, were like that for me too. And then when you're growing up and, and you get to that 15 or 16 stage, that's when everybody is starting to experiment and partying and going out or doing drugs or, or whatever they have to do or want to do or whatever. And it's like, that's 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 really when you know if, you, if you're gonna make it or not, you know what I mean? Which path are you gonna take and are you disciplined enough and all that kind of stuff. And like, I'm just grateful that like, I was around Moto so much that like, yeah, I, I, was, I was honestly like scary to even go and try any of those things because it was like i i've heard so many stories of riders who have went down those roads and it ended up how it ended up so like moto like kept me away from all that and was like i was just like level-headed like the whole time and that's like something i can say like the the sheltered you know thing of, of moto like it it teaches you in a way like it, it teaches you to be a the good kid in a way you know did you ever want to be a bad kid like was that ever in you to like wanna come <sighs> oh of be? course yeah there okay. are so many times yeah. where like you could like you could easily be like oh that sounds so fun you know yeah. what i mean and like you hear your friends like oh dude one party ain't gonna help or hurt like just just like it's not that it's not that bad dude just let's come and and we'll have fun and do whatever and i'm like god sounds fun you know what i mean sounds cool but uh, luckily enough, I was just, I was, I was always like, nah, you know, I, I know where that goes in a way, you know what I mean? And, uh, I credit a lot of that kind of era for me to, uh, the fairies because I was with them around that age. So like yeah. just being around their family enough, like I was just like, nah, like I'm, I'm good. Yeah. When, when you, uh, to go back to the story of, uh, those dudes breaking it into your house, like, were you, how mm-hmm. scared were you after that? Like, did that fuck you up for a while after that whole deal? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, I was a kid then, you know what I mean? So I didn't really understand. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty hard, you know what I mean? But, um, it was honestly all just a blur from there, you know, in, in a way, cause like it, it brought our family so much closer in a way. And, uh, it was like one of those little reality checks that like just brought the family super close and we like, we never left each other's side. And, uh, it, it, it felt weird for like, if one family member was out doing whatever, like just us there felt weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was one of the things that, I think just helped us in general because dude like or like when I went racing like the whole family went racing you know what I mean like that was yeah. just what we did and as a kid like not really understanding it like 
I, I like my dad has like a scar from like his like chest all the way down by his like belly button just from where he had to get surgery because he actually had a, he had a bullet from that night because uh, I remember he, he like tried to wrestle the gun away or whatever and, and he actually ended up getting shot and uh, yeah I mean I just I remember staying at my grandma my grandparents house for a while after that until we could figure out everything that was going on and um yeah I mean it's just uh, like those are the things that you know nobody knows and like I don't know it's hard to talk about because I don't talk about this kind of stuff I don't ever try to like yeah. do the feel bad for me stuff I was saying earlier but yeah, I mean, that's that's why me and my dad had such a close bond and everything because it was like, dude, I was so close to losing him, you know what I mean? And yeah, um, it brought us super close and like I lived and died by what he said, like what he said went for me yeah. growing up. And honestly, I he's the only reason why I'm, I'm here. Obviously, I had a lot of other help, but yeah, he is like he sacrificed absolutely pretty much his life, you know what I mean, for me to be here. So yeah man i don't think it like just i don't think it comes across like a poor me thing like this is your life dude you know like i've asked you to come on the podcast because mm. i'm very interested in you as a person and your life so i mean i definitely yeah. don't think it comes across like a a poor me thing um if anything dude it makes me appreciate you more as a person like i think it's fucking dope that you can overcome all this shit like do even just it's so easy to die in those neighborhoods <laughs> like that's if that's a, yeah. a reality of you live in those neighborhoods like a lot of people die that grow up there yeah yeah i mean that's just the harsh reality and i mean that's just that's just life in general you know what i mean like you can do anything and and it be your last day out so i don't know it's it's just life honestly and like that's kind of how i just i took it like well you know what like it's it is what it is in a way and just got to keep trucking forward big time dude um was your dad one of those full like street smart g dudes that just gave you like really solid advice that was just learned from a hard knock life <laughs> yeah no it's it's funny because like i feel like a lot of people now like just off of I, I don't know just just me being young or something like a lot of people talk to me that are older and they're like they're trying to like kind of little bro me in a way and it's like I I know I feel like I know a lot more than everyone here in a way you know what I mean just off of how much experience and how much stuff me and my dad have talked about and everything like I I feel like I feel so much older than what yeah. I am in a way and um obviously I'm not the one to just like get advice and it go in one ear not the other I'm not trying to say it like that but yeah, I, I feel like he, 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 I'm definitely, I was ready for life before I was ready for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know what you're saying. Do you, are you down to talk about like your dad going away and like the whole, that whole situation and where you're at with that? Like, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm also going to kind of stay lenient with it because, yeah, uh, yeah. I have a project coming out with Troy Adam Edison. Obviously he's, uh, going to tell my story. Um, yeah. and we're going to try to get into some, like some bigger eyes than just, uh, the moto community. So, yeah, yeah. um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to give you like answers, but you know what I mean? I'm not going to give everything cause a lot of my life is what we're going to Tell. yeah 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 so i guess what are you comfortable to talk about about that stuff then <clears throat> um fire away dude go for well, it well so like i guess well how old were you when when it happened and, and what happened like and you know what can you kind of remember the the whole deal and uh i think uh i was somewhere around 13 or 14 i think somewhere around there and um I mean, we we knew or whatever, we just off of like he he my dad was super straight up with me, so he told me or warned me about it like super early, and I kind of knew for a while before it even happened. But, yeah, okay. Um, I remember my dad came up to me and he was just I, I was like 
whatever, I don't know, I was playing Xbox or something in the room and he came in and he sat down with me and like he put his arm around me and he was just like, uh, like I might be going away. And uh, that was a super hard time for me as a kid because I felt like, like I didn't really understand, obviously. And also it was just like, my dad was everything to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was a daddy's boy. I went with my dad everywhere. So obviously that affected me. And I don't know. It was just, it was a really weird time because it was something in the household that we knew, but we didn't want to talk about. Like we were so into just like being with him and being present. And that was all we really cared about. Honestly, we didn't like, wasn't one of those things that we would talk about really. Like yeah. we didn't talk about it and it just honestly felt like it was one of those things that just happened. And, and do you, so did you go to like, were you going to like the courtroom and stuff like that? And kind of, were you sort of seeing the whole process? Nah, he never, he or? never, yeah, no, nah, I don't think he wanted me to have any type of part in that or whatever. So I was always home and, uh, I think I was honestly, he would make sure I was in Georgia, I think. Yeah. He would always make sure I was in Georgia and training and wouldn't ever say anything about that. So him and my mom would go through that deal. And obviously, I know now as I'm older, but that's when they would do all that. And how long uh, has he been away for? Uh, I mean, since I was... 14 so yeah so like next seven I mean, years kind of now yeah yeah and yeah. how much long has he got nearing the end of it yeah <laughs> sick okay uh it's as of right now um i want it i want to say it's he's in it he'll be in that like a. he's he'll be out but he won't be out in a way like it'd be like yeah, a halfway yeah. deal yeah but yeah. um i think it's either next year or the year after fuck that's so sick and what's the i guess the communication and stuff been like i mean is it is it easy to kind of like stay tight uh yeah i mean we we we're super tight but now we start to butt heads over racing and it's like oh, just really? normal like yeah father son butting head stuff but uh yeah you know we go through our stints where we're like super super tight and then i'll do something that pisses him off over the weekend and then we have to argue about it and then we'll talk to each other again in a couple of weeks we're in the, we're in that deal right now oh that, i mean that's that's fucking rad though that sounds like you guys are in a like a pretty good place <laughs> of it yeah mm-hmm. yeah now we're fine i mean he's just honestly yeah it's like normal like he just talks a lot of shit and then me we're like me and my dad are super we're we're both hard-headed and we're both really alike so we just we're, we're always going at it but it's it's in a it's in like it's not going at it as in like in a bad way like it's it's he's saying the right things but he just pisses me off yeah yeah no, I, f- <laughs> I, I feel you i feel you <laughs> normal sounds, dad stuff yeah, yeah, exactly yeah, that, that sounds about as normal as it gets um how <laughs> did that affect you like straight after that i mean did that because again it's like we literally can go back to that whole weightlifting thing it's like you can look at that one way it's like all right mm-hmm. you know this is uh you know i can kind of grow from this i can use this for motivation or it's like this could be the thing that kind of you just like fuck this fuck the world kind of deal mm-hmm. i mean it was a little bit of everything in a way um but i don't even I don't really even know. Like I, I, I went through a stage before, mm, right before I got to fairies and like a little bit of like maybe the first year I was at fairies where I was like, yeah, like I don't want to say I didn't care about moto, but it was like, dude, like I was so mentally shot that yeah. like I didn't know how to deal with anything in a way. You know what I mean? So like I just would come off fish, stand off fish and it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but honestly, I didn't even care. So like a lot of people had it in their mind that I was just like some dickhead kid or whatever. And it was just me going through like the pain that I was going through, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it was a year where 
I didn't even really care about dirt bikes in a way. And then honestly, it wasn't until, uh, I was at the ferries where I really started to like relearn loving dirt bikes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fuck dude, it makes sense. Like it's such a heavy thing, uh, to go through. And then I feel like there's probably a lot of pressure that you felt to like take care of your mom as well. Um, you know, and then mm-hmm. it's like, you've got to be away training while your mom's at home and going through that whole yeah. deal. So, yeah. I mean, that's, it is a lot for mm-hmm. like a young kid to have to take on. Exactly. It's a lot more than what, you know, like the normal people, they don't, they don't think about like that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So I'm being sent off here and like, oh, another dickhead kid thinks he's too good. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, I, I like I was, I know like a lot of my money went to just making sure like everything was good at home. Honestly, like I would, I would go and I'd win the super mini classes or whatever. And then like I would come back home and then it'd be like, oh, the, uh, like my, my mom or my grandma would be home. My mom would be working cause she would get up at three or four o'clock in the morning and not come back until six just off trying to make enough money, you know? Mm. And I remember I'd come back from training or whatever. And this was a while I was at ferries actually. So I would come back from their house and I would be back in Bellevue and my grandma would be like, uh, like don't, don't turn on the AC. Like your mom can't afford it. So I would always just try to cover whatever would help my mom out in a way. You know what I mean? Whether that was groceries or making sure the electricity was on or whatever like I always tried to make sure she was getting that so that's where like a lot of my amateur money went honestly it was just like home and then I have two little brothers too and like obviously I don't want them to know it's a struggle like you know what I mean like we hid that honestly in a way like no everything's fine and uh i mean how many people knew what you were going through like that i'm sure that obviously like the fairies knew the bells <laughs> knew but was this something that was common mm. knowledge or was this something that you were just sort of because like there's an industry right like you were jaleek swole like as an amateur mm-hmm. you were doing really good yeah. you had support like you were mm-hmm. a dude in the industry that a lot of people knew about like i'm a kid from australia and i knew about you you know like um mm-hmm. So how many yeah. people knew the struggle that you were going through? Were you like really trying to hide this from everybody and just do it like all in the background? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never cared about people knowing that like at home stuff, to be honest with you. I never really cared. And uh, obviously like I just felt like I was in a place where if I even if I talked about it, like would it really even change anything? You know what mm. I mean? And like. I mean, I know, I know the fairies would help and stuff, but I don't like, I wouldn't even try to put that on them. You know what I mean? And like, I would, I would obviously have the savings. Like I would, I've saved up a lot of what I won just for helping my mom. And even at the end of the years, like Husky would give like the normal amateur deals. Like you get however many bikes at the end of the year and you get to sell that or whatever. Like I would give my mom a bike just for her, just for her to keep all the cash and help like stay like a little bit more afloat or whatever. And obviously I would do the little things that I could help. And that was like everything I was talking about, like electric and yeah, uh, yeah. groceries or bringing back dinner or whatever. So that was, that was what we did. And um, I never cared to, never cared to really, tell people I just didn't feel maybe at the time it maybe it was just comfortable maybe I didn't want people to know or yeah whatever like I'm pretty far past it so it's like I don't even know how I was feeling back then I just knew yeah, I was super yeah. standoffish I felt like nobody could relate to me yeah and nobody was like me in moto everybody was entitled everybody cared about way different things than I cared about and all I really cared about was that my mom didn't have to come home and struggle more than what she was already going through dude it's fucking gangster (laughs) to be honest like to put your family on your back like that as a young kid and to step up i mean 
I'm assuming your dad probably had conversations with you that that said, you know, like, hey, like, take care of your mom, like, you got to be the man, and mm. it's like, that's a fucking heavy thing to to wear as a kid, and you know, you're trying to make a career that's like, it's not an easy career, like, there's no guarantees in the route that that you took, but it almost seems like hearing this that it's sort of like failing at moto just didn't even seem like kind of an option for you yeah no exactly and like a lot of i feel like a lot of people have that kind of backup plan in a way you know what i mean like oh this can't work then maybe i can just like fit in with some family or do whatever and and i didn't have that you know i mean like it was like do or die you know and um and although I was going through what I was telling you earlier, where I was like in a, in a weird spot where I didn't even care about dirt bikes. Like I didn't care about racing or winning. I cared about making money. You know what I mean? To help out. So like, I don't know. I was just locked in that mindset in a way. And like the little things, I mean, I mean, even in rookie season, like I told you, I was struggling mentally and stuff like that. Like it was always that back in mind thought that was like, all right, I've been through way worse shit than this. And there's no plan B. That's such a powerful thing. And there's no plan B. Dude, like I believe, man, I believe in that shit so much. Like I always, Mm -hmm. like I'm lucky in the sense that I always, I mean, dude, so when I come back from America, like all my shit got fucked up in America. I was like, I was just, I was not planning to come back to Australia. I was, had my Mm -hmm. mindset on just staying in America, doing my thing. That plan got fucked up. And I had, like, I didn't, I didn't talk about this that much, but like I had no money, like literally no money. I had enough camera equipment Mm -hmm. to do the podcast and I had no money i had no car i had literally nothing i came back to australia at 29 years old feeling like a fucking piece of shit and i'm lucky like Mm -hmm. i went i was you know like i said 29 went back to living at my parents house and like the podcast Mm -hmm. to me was like that that was it i didn't have there was no other i didn't have a plan b i'd had these skills and the contacts that i'd kind of worked on but it was like i i stayed in my parents but that was it i was like i want no help Uh, Mm -hmm. there this is there's no fucking there's no other way out of this like this is gonna work and i'm just gonna go all in on that i didn't even want to put like i didn't apply for one job i didn't go on any unemployment which i could have got in australia i did nothing i wanted my fucking Mm -hmm. back against the wall and just like get Mm -hmm. myself out of that situation because I think that that's the most powerful place that you can be in life if you accept it the Mm -hmm. right way and you're like, there is no fucking plan B, dude. This is the only thing that I can yeah. do to make this shit work. There is so much power that you can take from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. There's there's like, there's beauty and struggle in a way. You Bro, know what I mean? Like sure. you, you really find out who you are. And uh, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, like you don't have anything, no plan B, no nothing. You have to go for it. And like, that's one of the things that was like, like I can totally relate to how you felt in that way. You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, it's funny to just like hear someone else's story. That's like completely different, but in a way like puts you in the same spot mentally makes you think honestly the same way. You know what I mean? You have to have a certain mentality and you don't have that mentality. Like you have nothing. And, uh, no, nah, it's 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 good to hear another story like that because it's it's like it reinnovates you. You know what I mean? And uh, the, like I said, the beauty and the struggle. Yeah, man, I I almost said that to you before. Like what you were talking about, something. I was like, man, it's beautiful. Like the struggle sometimes is some of the most beautiful things that you can go through. And and I mean, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Like everything. I, like I said before, I have the best life in the world. I would not want to change it. I'm sitting in a dope studio. Mm-hmm. Like every everything is great again with it's not a poor me none of that shit but it's like i look back at those times where you know like i i remember going to like the baggage claim or like the checking into a flight and i knew all my bags were overweight Mm -hmm. and it was like i didn't (laughs) i i did not have the money to pay for excess bags so if they hit me mm-hmm. up on some excess baggage shit, like I just couldn't pay for it. I couldn't get home from 
where mm-hmm. I was going, you know? And it's like, in the moment, that shit fucking sucks and you feel worthless in that yeah. moment. But now mm-hmm. I look back at it and I'm proud of myself for the way that I handled yeah. that situation. I'm proud that I didn't give up. I'm proud that I had all these you know things uh, uh that were kind of like you know going against you and then you just stay true like again you're just like there's no fucking plan b like i'll figure out a way to get on this flight mm-hmm. and i will and you always you do like if you if you don't have an option like you fucking figure it out yeah exactly no and i think that's i think that's why i carry myself with like the confidence and like carefree attitude that i do is like you look back at all the other things and what could have happened and you know what I mean and those things make you and that's what I'm saying like all the past stuff like is literally just like who I am today now like I'm just I'm super chill and grateful and like happy to be in a spot where I'm at where I could I could help my mom whenever I want and not even care about it or my grandma or whatever and and like I'm just like, um, like debt free in a way, but like mentally, you know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm just so yeah. like calm and relaxed and like thinking back of that stuff on, you know, th- those are life achievements. You know what I mean? Like going through what you went through and being at rock bottom and, and now you have like a dope podcast and you get to talk to a bunch of different writers and all this kinds of stuff. Like it, it's like amazing. You know what I mean? And like makes you really really thankful for what you went through because now you're 10 times stronger than if you never had to do that oh for sure man and like and it's exactly kind of like what you said too i mean i can i can look in my my particular story and uh think about people that if i didn't have those people in my life i was fucked like completely fucked Mm -hmm. like wes williams Mm -hmm. if there's no wes williams i'm fucked there's no Jeremy Malott, I'm fucked. Mm-hmm. You know, like no Jay Ronenberg, I'm <laughs> fucked. Like there's so many people in my life and and then my parents and my family. Like there's so many people too along the way that like if those people weren't there, then man, this is just a diff- a different story. Like you literally can't like you can't do it on your own, eh? And I think you've got those same people mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, exactly. No, like it and I and I sound like I'm just like a broken copy when I say I wouldn't be here without this person, this person, because it was it was such a group effort. You know what I mean? Without uh, my practice guy Brandon Loser, like uh, I wouldn't I I wouldn't have been at any other races. And without my mom, all those long nights and early mornings and everything, I wouldn't be here. My grandma I'm watching my brothers while everybody's gone from the house, like wouldn't be here. And then like the fairies like I give them so much credit and they're like like I I literally still go to their house now and like I'll just pop up randomly and just open the door like I don't even knock like it's like my family you know what I mean and like with they completely reshaped me and like like my attitude and just like how I carry myself and just absolutely everything and honestly even without Evie uh Tim's wife like I wouldn't be doing these types of podcasts or opening up to Troy about my stories or anything because I didn't care to talk about any of that. That was her, like, Mm. like, come on, like, you're somebody who, like, people can, like, strive off of in a way. I totally agree. Find hope where there's no hope in a way. And, uh, yeah, without Evie, like, I don't even think anybody would know what I went through or anything even about me. So without her and Tammy uh obviously being my riding coach and helping me through every everything and uh 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 Evan Ferry his little kid that I used to beat up like all that like everything plays into a part and yeah it's my family I love I love all those guys man I'm I'm so I'm so glad and grateful for her for to try and kind of like swing you around to, to talk about this stuff because yeah, I mean, that you mm. you are, well, she is, right? And I mean, that's kind of the reason why I'm like pumped to talk to you about this stuff is because you're an uncommon person, dude, whether you like it or not, like extremely uncommon. Mm-hmm. You, you came from a place where you look at the statistics and it doesn't end up where you end up. Like you're the 1% of the 1%. Mm-hmm. And you, it's not an ego thing. I know you're not trying to get any 
accolades and awards out of it but it's like dude imagine mm. the imagine mm. the kids that can that can look up to you and that you can give yeah. hope to i mean you inspire the fuck out of me my life's dope like you know I, i'm taking shit from from mm. you and i think that there is a lot of power that you know can be um like exactly what you said there's beauty in the struggle you know and if you can if you can be a guy yeah. that can like give a message and say like hey this is the stuff that i went through and it fucking sucks but it's so beautiful yeah. and like when you make it through on the other side i'm like look at where you're at now dude you know like you're a factory rider you win winning races you're getting paid and your family ain't gonna have to struggle anymore your dad's gonna get out he's gonna mm-hmm. see you win races like that's fucking rad yeah yeah exactly that's why i just i don't take anything for granted like i i look back at all that stuff and in me re visiting those times in my life like like reduce me in a way in terms of just like all right I was I was tripping over whatever I was tripping about like I have it great you know what I mean I have it beyond great like I have you know what I mean like I have my own apartment and I'm like I'm all grown up and have my own vehicle I'm traveling across you know the United States with my girlfriend and like I'm just like I'm in such a like just such a great place mentally you know what I mean and then like uh all the team like uh Sean Murphy our team coordinator and uh Scuba Westfall like the team manager like dude I'm like like those are that's family too like everybody who I'm close with and knows me like we're, we're all family like I don't I don't consider anybody who I'm close with like friends like yeah, I'm yeah. literally like like my circle is like blood to me in a yeah, way yeah yeah no I, yeah i totally can uh understand where you're coming from on that one who who were you looking up to like uh when you were uh, a young kid racing like was was it like sh- the stewards that were kind of the the people <laughs> that you were looking up to the most um yeah you know like i obviously i cheered for uh James and Malcolm like like I, I that's who I wanted to win when I watched races as a kid um but when I got to Bells like dude, I didn't know anything about moto besides the fact that uh <laughs> like like I rode hard rock in uh Florida you know what hard rock is I've heard of it yeah uh so that was like our like little nostalgic track in o- Ocala like that's where I grew up racing that's that's really all I knew was like a little PW track said peewee and I did laps around there all day and that's all I I knew of racing really until I went to Bells and then like I didn't know racing was like these big amateur nationals where all these guys were there or whatever I just knew it was like local races like every other whatever yeah, yeah. showed up and there's yeah. people there that's all I knew and so when I went to the Bells like they actually brought us to races and like I honestly only looked up to Zach and Chase like you can ask like anybody I was around back then like I was a little kid and like I I rode around with my fucking elbows down to my knees cuz that's what they did you know what I mean and like yeah. it was just that was the thing to do you know what I mean and like I considered Zach and Chase like my brothers like I was and they would too like they would literally consider me like their little brother you know what I mean and like those are the only two people I've looked up to, you know what I mean? And, uh, I didn't really have any racers or anything. I was just a little kid and I knew who I went with. So that was Zach and Chase. And those were like my idols, you know what I mean? And like the more I started to like realize and, and, and like learn about moto and stuff like that, I started to appreciate, uh, Malcolm and James and stuff like that. And then, uh, and then lucky enough, like, just me being on seven and and how that all kind of transpired and Malcolm knew my story from Roger uh Malcolm started helping me when I was like really really young and like he would come to Loretta's with me and make sure he was like he would text me and like check in on me and all that kinds of stuff so and then it was like I didn't really have a chance for those types of people to be like role models or anything because it, it they just became family like so quickly in a way you know what I mean like I always uh was grateful for Malcolm because Malcolm 
he didn't have to go out of his way to make time for me like after a bad moto and come check on me and shit like that like usually you have a bad moto and like guys are like oh i'm not even gonna like i'm not gonna yeah go you know what i mean and like malcolm was one of those people like I'd be in my motorhome crying after a race and he would just open the door and be in there and like talking it out and all that kind of stuff. And same with fairies and all those guys. So like I never really had the chance to have role models in a way, you know what I mean? Cause everybody who I kind of looked up to was like there for me, you know? That's so rad, dude. So when, uh, when you went and stayed at the, or I guess when did it become a thing for you where you're like okay i'm gonna be a professional dirt bike racer and i'm gonna make money and that's gonna be my life like when was that flip in your uh, in your mind um it was i want to say it was like really late honestly like i don't know obviously i i got on huskies when i was pretty much right in the super minis mm. so obviously I had the confidence of like, yeah, like I'm on a factory team. Like they believe in me, you know, mm. but I didn't really start to believe in anything until I was on 125s because when I was on 125s, that's when I started to beat a lot of the kids that were on other factory bikes and that were getting a lot more hype than I was at the time. So like, that's when I started to believe it and was like, I went to Loretta's and Schoolboy and won both titles. And I was like, Oh, well, I'm pretty good, you know, because <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't go into Loretta's thinking I was going to win. I was just like, all right, let's have fun, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I got both those titles and then that's when I kind of started to believe it. And then it just kind of started like the ball started rolling more and more and more as the years went gone or gone by just off of good races, good placings. Like I felt like I was always in that top one through three bunch. And, and so when you moved to the ferries and you were you living there pretty much full time or were you like living at home and then you'd go like, just go there to train? <laughs> um, it's a funny story actually, because, uh, uh, so Hewitt actually set this all up. Bobby, Bobby. Yeah. That's who, um, hit. Yeah. Bobby Hewitt, Bobby Hewitt and, uh, scuba were the ones who were really, uh, pushing for me to go to, uh, uh, fairies. Um, so they push for that. And, uh, it's funny enough because like it's when the fairies are like, all right, yeah, we'll do it. Like I was, I was like, no, I'm, I'm staying with Brandon, like loser. The guy's talking yeah, about who yeah, took me over. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm staying with him. Like that, that, that's my family. You know what I mean? Like that, that was my security in a way because it was just like, that's who I did everything with after yeah. my dad went away. So I was like, uh, no, that's who I'm staying with. And he had a place that was like uh, an hour away from where we rode in Dade City. So I was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to stay with them. And uh, Evie actually forced me to live in their house so they could get to know me and we could start to build a bond. But I was like super hesitant and shy and I never talked to. And like it was a really rough stay. But like I'm glad that we had to go through that because like, dude, I was I was like pretty rebellious from that. I was like, I remember Brandon told me, he was like, no, Evie, Evie said that, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna stay at their house. And I was like, dude, are you effing kidding me? Like, no, I'm not staying over there. No, I'm not. And then I was forced to, and I just had to learn to be honestly something I'm not in a way, you know what I mean? Like, how do you mean? They, they would always have people come over and I would have to introduce myself and talk is like, I was I don't know if it was just off what I went through or what, but I was all in a way antisocial. Like I didn't want to talk to yeah. you. I didn't want to be around you. I didn't trust you. I had three or four people I trusted. And I don't know this, this goes back to like the mad at the world thing that you're talking about earlier, but like in a way I was, you know what I mean? Like I was like, these people don't know me. They don't know what I've been through. I don't care to know what they've been through. I don't care to be around them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just how I was. I don't know if that was just my safety net or what, but that's how I was. And like they made me talk and be social and open up and, uh, just change like my whole attitude around and like kind of just guiding me in terms of like, we know you're not, meaning to come off this way but you're coming off this way you know mm. what I mean and so it was nice to have that type of family to ease me into something else because 
obviously, yeah, like the fairies went through what they went through, but they have a big house and everything's good and they have everything figured out in life and they they're on top of absolutely everything yeah and that's kind of the opposite of what i've came from you yeah. know what i mean yeah. so it was a big learning curve and it took a lot of time and I, w- I would say it was only until like my second year being there where it was like i started finally opening up to him yeah but like i give like i praise them for everything because they could have been like, all right, yeah, this kid's weird after year one yeah, and me yeah, still not talking, yeah. you know what I mean? And be like, all right, yeah, we're done with him. But like they gave me the benefit of the doubt and kept on having me around and like it shaped me into who I am now. And and I'm still, I'm not the best at it. Like I'll, I'll still have my times where like I'll side eye somebody yeah, and, yeah. and just like go about my day, you know what I mean? But like I, I'm, I'm a lot better. Like I'll, I'll talk. I'll shake your hand. I could absolutely hate you, but I, I still come up to you and, and like do normal human decency stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's all the kind of stuff that I learned while being at the ferries. Man, it, it sort of sounds, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sort of sounds like there's almost a little <clears throat> bit of like survivor guilt in a way too. Like, have you heard of that whole concept? Of, mm. You know, like where mm-hmm. you kind of, I'm assuming that, you know, you're in this super nice house with this family that's mm-hmm. like the you know white picket fence but with a motocross track in the backyard kind of family and then you're <laughs> from a completely different world and like your mom's still in that world your grandma's still in that world your two brothers mm-hmm. are still in that world so i'm sure there was probably some internal conflict going on even about like enjoying mm-hmm. where you were living because it's like well i you know i don't yeah. even want to enjoy this because of what everyone else is kind of going through you know i'm sure that kind of fucked with your head a yeah. little bit no exactly yeah exactly like um <clears throat> yeah i was like uh from that point when i moved into the fairy's house like i was obviously like stable like everything was gonna be good you know yeah. but um yeah, obviously, yeah, my mom is still living whatever with trying to save money by not using the AC in the summer and, like, like keeping all the lights off just so, the, like, electricity bill isn't high and and all that kind of stuff. And, like, I knew all that stuff while I was there. So I, I do think that a lot of it probably came from that. But I don't know. I was so level-headed and, and trying to get to where I was going just so – eventually I could fix that yeah that like I tried to be more in the moment than like not but like obviously that's a super hard th- like that's a hard thought process for a kid you know what I mean yeah. going into a household that he doesn't know anybody in and then like yeah like I do know like I got two little brothers back home my grandma and my mom still back there and like it is hard but I felt like I felt like I knew that like it wasn't going to get better unless I put in the work yeah, and yeah. actually focused and did exactly what the fairies told me to do and stuff like that. And I got super uh, like tunnel vision in a way to just get to where I'm going to and then I'll fix this when I can. Yeah, dude, it's so rad. I actually I listened to a podcast the other day um by this guy naval he's like this indian dude that he was like an immigrant moved to america mm-hmm. when he was a baby and uh, he ended up he's like this super fucking famous and wealthy tech investor he's like one of the first dudes in bitcoin mm-hmm. like the dude's a g right and um so i was listening mm-hmm. to this podcast that he did the other day it was like three and a half hours on this tweet storm that he did and it was all about um basically it was like how to get rich But it's that none of it's like, this is what Mm -hmm. you do to make, like, get rich quick shit. It's like these morals and values that if you live by, and he talked about some of the lanes where you actually can make money. And like, there was some good, you know, uh, technical money advice in there. But the, one of the things that like really Mm -hmm. stuck with me um, was he talked about this whole concept of building wealth while you don't have money. So it's like, what Mm -hmm. like you can be wealthy so and i mean i i kind of relate that back to myself like i mean i i put everything that i make from the podcast into the podcast like i don't have a house i Mm -hmm. get a free car so i don't have a car like there's still a lot of stuff i don't have right but i like everything goes back into the business and at times Mm -hmm. you can feel i mean at times i feel like 
a bit of a fucking idiot in a way because I'm like I'm 33 I don't have a mm-hmm. house there's all this shit I don't have that like society says that you should have right and uh, yeah. and yeah. then when I was listening to this podcast and he's talking about like being wealthy doesn't mean that it's different to being rich with money and you can build wealth mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you don't have to have money to, to build this kind of wealth and then I started thinking I'm like damn dude like there's like you know 25 million downloads of this podcast overall and that's worth something mm-hmm. to someone at mm-hmm. some point and next year and then the year after like i'm building i'm building and i started to look i'm like well damn like when you look at this it's like i'm wealthy and i'm like building wealth and that this will yeah. this will yeah. pay off at some point and it seems like that's kind of the mentality that you had is that you were just kind of like in this grind and what you wanted at the time like you were really far away from what you wanted at the time but you were just like committed to like mm-hmm. building that wealth almost like you were you were working on becoming wealthy yeah. when you had no money yeah exactly and like when i talk back about things that have happened in my life like i almost forget that they've even happened in a way until i really start to like dig because it's like i had so many years that just like flew by just because I was so focused on yeah, what I was focused yeah, on yeah. and that was it so it's like it, it's funny to like think back at all these like different things that I'm starting to talk about because it's like it was like at one point it was like this was in <laughs> this was in the bank like I I don't even remember this stuff because I, I went right through it and that's the same thing like when I started talking about a lot of this stuff at fairies because it was like dude I was I was like I was so focused in, in grinding and, and yeah. doing what I was doing that I just flew through the year in a way. Like, I remember uh, it might have been, like, 2019, I think, like, after my A uh, Loretta's year. And I was, like, I started thinking back about, like, B class and 125s and all that stuff. And it was just, like, dude, no way we're in 2019 you know what I mean like it felt like just yesterday it was 2016 and I was riding around listening to Lil Uzi and just racing my 125 so it's like it's funny to you know like think back and be like geez like everything's flying by yeah man I dude I can relate to that for these last couple years with COVID I mean my whole life has been spent Mm -hmm. my whole adult life has been spent Mm -hmm. traveling around the world going to races going all these different places and then uh COVID comes and I mean I haven't been on a plane in two years I like I live in a small Mm. beach town in Australia and my studio my house is like three miles away from the studio and I go here mm-hmm. every single day and then I'll go to the gym and then I'll go to the track <laughs> on the weekends. So for two years, man, it's like, I mean, I've done a couple driving trips, but it's like two years I've just lived yeah. in this bubble and I was just like, you put your head down mm-hmm. and you just do the fucking work. And exactly what you said, man, like yeah. I look up yeah. and the, there's two years gone. And then, you know, even um, mm-hmm. like uh, you look back, someone asked, the well, Red Bull hit me up and they asked for some stats on the podcast for this year. Yeah, and it was in yeah. like it was in June, and uh, they were like, "Oh, how many podcasts have you done so far this year?" And I was like, "I don't even know." And I went and counted, and it was I'd done fifty two podcasts by June, and it's just like Jeez. you just sit and you just put your head down and you fucking grind mm-hmm. because like my hands are tied right now, like the borders are closed. I can't yeah. go, like I can't go anywhere. Yeah. You can't. And it's like well shut up and fucking do the work i guess <laughs> it's funny that's like that for you though like you said like you you go and you do your podcast you go to gym and you ride or whatever and like let's say if someone took all of that away from you and was like all right in two weeks we'll give this back time would be the slowest thing yeah, yeah. ever like right now like i didn't have races to go through when uh after i crashed out of iron man i had my shoulder problem I was sitting at home and like, I literally just had, I had no schedule in front of me. I had absolutely nothing to do, but to figure out my shoulder, that was it. And like time felt like it was in slow motion. Like I remember I would try to, I I would try to take naps or whatever I could to make the day speed up just so it can be another day. Like it, it, once you get into such a process of like, you wake up, you do this, you do this later and you do this at night, like that's when everything works according to plan and you feel like you're 
you're applying yourself in a way that like makes you feel like okay I had a productive day and also it makes the day fly by because you're doing what you're doing and it's it's a process you know yeah oh man I um I reckon I feel like I speak about this book pretty much every time anyone comes on the podcast but there's this book called Atomic Habits mm -hmm. and uh I don't know if you're much of a reader but if you like reading or audiobooks you should fucking listen to this book and it pretty much says like exactly that right and there's this analogy in there that stuck with me so much where it, it, he said that you got eight people on the start line of the 100 meter finals at the Olympics, right? So that's eight of the best mm -hmm. dudes in the world, the 1% of the 1%. And they've all got the same goal, and that's to win a gold medal. Mm -hmm. Seven people mm -hmm. fail at that goal, right? One person wins. So mm -hmm. at this point, it's like the goal doesn't matter. The goal don't mean shit. What mm -hmm. means shit is the <laughs> process. And if that's exactly what you mm -hmm. just said. Like all you have is this yeah. process. So it's like almost you reverse engineer, like whatever you think your goal is, you go like, okay, what would be the process that would get me to this goal? And then you figure out that yeah. process and then you just do it over and over and over and <laughs> over and you just try and get yeah. it better and better. And, and you learn every year, you get like a little bit more knowledge and you're like, that then you can be like okay work smarter not harder so that that to me is like honing in the process like getting the process more and more yeah. streamlined you get better at cooking the right food you, you get better at going to bed <laughs> at the same time like you know like you just everything becomes yeah. about like almost just like sharpening the fucking blade every day you're just sitting there just sharpening mm -hmm. that blade yeah exactly yeah i mean anything competitive and, and and not a team sport like everybody's working you know what i mean like i don't ever go to the line and and look down left and right and be like oh this guy didn't belong here you know what yeah. i mean like i i know every night or every you know uh, during the day moto like it, it's gonna be a fight because everybody has sacrificed just as much as you and they're here because they deserve to be here you know and it's funny, like, just, I try, like, this is something that I'm trying to be better at now. And this is why I, I try to be so carefree and stuff. And it, it is like being in the moment, but not letting time go by as fast. Like, I, mm. I want to really appreciate everything. You know what I mean? And like, I want to, I want to have fun and race my dirt bike and, enjoy absolutely everything I have to go through I mean I wake up days obviously and like <laughs> Baker's is brutal obviously we all have uh we all we all train and we all do our own stuff but like I know for me like I wake up and I'm like fuck, fuck can I do it today you know what I mean yeah. and I fucking I get up and I eat my breakfast and I fucking drive to work you know go through the gate and then I'm like you're in it you know yeah, what I mean like you, yeah. you don't you don't have that same process anymore but it's like I'm trying to get better and better at at really enjoying it you know what I mean in a way and not not trying to dwell on like any little thing you know what I mean because it's super easy to uh listen to your own thoughts you know what I mean your head is like your fucking your your biggest nightmare in a way most of the time it's like that's what messes people up you know what I mean and and I'm trying to be better and better at just being more positive and, and living in the moment. Yeah, man, it, it's definitely, uh, uh, well, cause I mean, that's all you got, you know, like if it, the future is just something yeah. that you can think about and the past is something that you can mm -hmm. think about. And when you really look at that, it's like yeah. all, all you actually have is, is the moment. And man, that's one of the kind of cool things. Mm -hmm. Like people always say to me, like, how do you do the podcast for three hours? And it's just like, man, you're just in the moment. Like it's a, this is a dope. <laughs> it flies by. Yeah. It's a dope experience. Like you got someone across from mm -hmm. you that's like live this crazy life. And it's like, and I'm only going to have that three hours. Like I don't like, we won't get <laughs> this three hours again. Like we might do another podcast, but we'll be talking yeah. about different shit. It'll be a different time. Like it's like, we just, yeah. we only have this right now. And it's like, why would you think about anything else? Yeah. Why would you be anywhere else when you're here? Huh? Exactly. And it goes through like the process you're talking about. Like, you know what I mean? If you, if we didn't have a set thing on, or if you didn't have the questions that you had to talk about, like we'd be sitting here fucking kicking our feet. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. we would, but 
it's that, you know, like you, you have your little set process on what's going to happen next, 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 next. And then next thing you know, yeah, like we're at three hours. So it didn't feel like that. You know what I mean? And, uh, I think it's easy to dumb it down and make that about life in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's super easy to just get it caught up in the, in the moment and be negative and whatever, but you love what you do and you come in you're happy about it. You're happy about talking about, you know, to someone else and, you're happy about that three hours. So it flies by, you know what I mean? And that goes to what I was saying about trying to be more positive about absolutely everything because you make everything fly by and, and it makes it like not miserable. I don't want to say that, but it just like those things that you might have found hard in the past. Yeah. <laughs> next thing you know, you have a different type of mindset on everything and then you're like, Oh, it's not that bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like and I'll, I'll, I'll say like my, fr- I say, listen, I've never touched a, a road bike until I went to Baker's yeah. and that's like a huge thing for yeah. motocross, right? Like he, everybody's on their road bike. So I remember I would go to road bike, uh, when we first got here and at the time it was Seth Rarick who was there and, uh, Mike Brown and, uh, Pettis was there and styles and everybody. And I remember I would, I'd be like, Oh, it's not so bad. And then they're like, Oh yeah, we're like, we're just on our warm up. <laughs> <laughs> and we would get like whatever 20 minutes 30 minutes in and they would they were like gone and i was just there and i'm like Dude, i fucking hate this like i hate the fucking road bike i hate it so much and then like next thing you know like we're a few months down and like i actually enjoy waking up in the morning and going on a spin and just like like the scenery and like the weather and everything it's honestly like a it's like a source of yoga in a way like it's yeah, just calming yeah. and like yeah it's, it's that grind you know what I mean like I've done it and made it repetitive and I changed my mindset about it and then now like that's one of the things I, re- I actually like doing regardless like I, I still suck but I keep up now you know what I mean and like <laughs> it's just it's fun to to like when you see the positives you know what yeah, I mean like yeah. I look back and I'm like, damn, they were just leaving me 20 minutes in. And then now I'm like completely fine. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's just something about seeing those like little goals and shit that just like makes everything like so much better. Oh, for sure. And then like, you know, whenever the next thing comes up now, you can just apply what you learn cycling to that same deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What? That's what I'm saying. Like there's so much about life that you can literally just, you can, you can dumb it down to absolutely anything and make yourself feel like, ah, oh, it's not that bad, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. So when you, uh, when you move with, uh, the ferries from a riding mm-hmm. perspective, how crazy yeah. was it to have access to Tim Ferry and the knowledge that he has and the tracks that, that they have like, was that a massive game changer for you? Yeah, I feel like that was where my oh, that was like where my career really started to shift in like the right direction, I feel like cuz like I don't know. I mean, I can't talk to Ferry about anything that he hasn't already been through when it comes down to yeah. his racing career, you know? So it was like a huge game changer for me. And, um, obviously he's a really big, uh, technique guy. So like, obviously we worked on technique all the time and, and I mean, I'm not the best obviously, but you still see some photos of my elbows completely down, but like, you know what I mean? I, I, Hey, when you got the bells think, as OGs, bro, uh, that's just part of it. You know? that's just, that's exactly. Just it just comes out. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, exactly. But it's like, I all like even even though I'm at Baker's right now, like I look back at you know it's like pictures from Bud's Creek or or Unadilla or or whatever, and I'll catch photos of me doing little things that I didn't even think about when I was there, but I'm doing those little things like now, you know what I mean? And like I start to see like little things and like pieces of like everything he's taught me, like kind of creep in like you know what I mean yeah and like he's just he's just like we we've kind of like reformed everything like I was saying earlier like I absolutely changed everything about myself when I was at fairies so like I, I I attribute everything to to those guys like literally everything like my riding 
and everything. And I remember uh, one of the days I was talking to Evie uh, and she was like, you know, Red Dog's only going to only going to say as much as you get from them. Mm. And I never under really never really understood that. Right. And I remember eventually I just started after motos asking Timmy, I'd be like, so where can I get better? Like, where can I get better? How can I do this better? Like whatever. And then like, and then that's when me and Ferry really started to mesh because he would literally just like dissect absolutely everything. And like there was, you know, before I started asking him those questions, I would come off motos and just be like, wow, he isn't saying much. Like, I wonder, mm. like, is he even, you know what I mean? Like what, like what's going on? And then, uh, I just started letting my guard down and just coming up to him and being like kind of vulnerable as a rider in a way, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, like, yeah, like, what can I do better? Like I'm, I'm trying and whatever. And then that's when we really started to get into how good fairy was. Like there was things that I would think that like, well, he's not paying attention to that. And he would yeah. say off rip, you know? Yeah. And that's when I really started to like figure out like, all right, like he really knows his shit. You know what I mean? Like, obviously he's been around absolutely everything in motocross. So like, obviously he knows what he's talking about, but like, for me, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like he's actually seeing the guy you. open up about literally absolutely everything when I didn't think that he was. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's when I started to get absolutely everything out of training that I was wanting to was like when I started asking the questions. And, and I even do that now, like with Mike and Alden or whoever, you know what I mean? And, um, that's one of the things that I got from the fairies, you know what I mean? Is like asking those questions and, and like that for a trainer, I feel like that helps them as well because they're like, oh, okay, this, this kid wants yeah. to learn, you yeah. know? And I feel like a lot of kids like come in and, and they expect that they expect the trainer to just be like, Hey, this blah, 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 you know, and it doesn't always work like that. Dude, that's so rad that you said that. Have you ever heard of the saying, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears? Yeah. That's yeah. that's you, mm -hmm. bro. You just weren't ready, man. You were you were closed exactly. off and you weren't being vulnerable. Like you weren't willing to be vulnerable and you weren't willing to like go out on the limb and, you know, sort of like acknowledge that you weren't exactly where you wanted to be. And then it's like as soon as you flip mm -hmm. that switch, it's like that teacher's there for you yeah exactly and uh yeah it was funny because it just it happened like literally next day like we were sitting on the couch me and evie and i was just like kind of picking her brain like is is timmy like is he, is he okay or like is he like even like what's going on you know what i mean in a way or and she was like no like he always he always comes back and uh talks to me about everything and and uh she was like just just ask him because he mm. tells me everything you just ask him so I started you know what I mean like opening up in that form and, and that honestly changed how my state was there you know what I mean and, and then eventually I found myself like I would be like other kids that he would have there and like they'd be kind of I, I, I would know that they were kind of in that spot you know what I mean and like I would tell him like he's only gonna say as much as you ask you know mm. what I mean and like I would ask Timmy stuff in front of him and then like it you know what I mean and then I started catching like more kids like starting to say hey what you know what I mean and like it's just like it, it's it's a cool thing to see you know what I mean like just wanting to learn you know what I mean I see a lot of kids that come in they're like oh like you know they're not really there for you know what I mean either their parents just want them to race or whatever yeah yeah and they're just like going through the motions but it's like it's cool to see kids that you know are like they, they want they want it you know what I mean they want to learn and that's just one of the things I had to learn at fairies that really helped me throughout now yeah yeah it's funny um I watched the video that Ando posted yesterday um with like the farewell to husky kind of deal and then he spoke about mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Alden thing and like leaving Alden and that husky wanted him to stay and mm -hmm. I I was mm -hmm. I'd never really thought about it until I listened to that bit in the video and I can't wait to talk to him about it but he said that um there was so many more people around there and for me to get better I had to be like really vulnerable but I didn't want to be vulnerable around those people 
and I that mm-hmm. man I th- I went away and I thought about that for all afternoon yesterday it was like on my mind thinking like mm-hmm. damn because I know Jason Anderson as the coolest motherfucker on the planet like I, I actually don't yeah. like you, you could take a dirt bike away and like the fact that he's one of the best dudes in the world like take that away and if you hang out with Jason Anderson like he's still gonna be like the coolest motherfucker you've ever met and uh and it's like mm-hmm. to hear a guy that's like that rad uh, say that, you know, mm-hmm. like I needed to be vulnerable to get better, but I just wasn't down to be vulnerable around all these people I didn't know. I, man, that mm-hmm. seems like it's so important part. Like it's such an important part of learning is that ability to like fully drop yeah. your guard. And even though you're one of the best in the world, say like, dude, what mm-hmm. do I got to do? Tell me where I suck yeah yeah exactly and that's where I, i've always tried to be uh be good at is just talking about it and trying trying to pick everybody else's brain honestly like i i always set those like bait questions out and like try to get somebody to say something to where i can start to kind of depict what they're talking about or uh just to learn in a way and and i feel like every every racer goes through their own um in their own deals of that because i mean i know like when i was uh maybe a or b or whatever and like we'd be at the test track and there'd be a all these people i don't i don't even know and like i'm still trying to learn whoops like i'm still trying to like i'm scared to death of a dragon's back or you know what i mean yeah it's like, yeah i don't want to go out there and look like a fucking idiot in front of all these people and and what are these people gonna say about like oh yeah that jaleek kid like oh, you know what i mean and like yeah those are all the little things for racers that it, yeah it is hard to be vulnerable because you're you're kind of just you're thinking about so many different things at once and um, it's all about just having those people that you trust around in a way, you know what I mean? And yeah. like trying to figure that out. Cause I, I wish now, like thinking back, I wish I would have gone out there and fucking crashed 18 times in the whoops. I like, I wish I would have went out and fucking endowed over the dragon's back one time or whatever. You know what I mean? Cause like, I, I feel like at the end of the day is like, I would suck in front of all these people and, and I would, I would, I would like literally dread going on the track with like Jason and all these guys that were super good. Cause I was like, dude, they're going to look, make me look like an idiot, you know? Yeah. And like I, when all those people would leave, I would go out and then I would do the shit completely fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like, it's that shift in the mindset of like, I don't give a shit what these people have to say. I'm going to do it. I'm going to learn it. And I don't care what they have to do or say or whatever, because I'm going to be ready when I'm going to be ready. You know what I mean? And that's just a mindset thing. And it is hard to get over. Like nobody wants to uh, mm. be that guy that's talked about. As, uh, like, you know what I mean? Like Cause everybody that, it wants does. to be People do talk on like top. That. Exactly. Like, I mean, I'm sure. After, I mean, I, I know after Tampa, right. When I didn't make the main, like I remember absolutely all the media outlets that were talking shit. And like, I made sure that like, after Arlington and after um, High Point, like these were all the same media guys that were like, oh, like mm. Swole is just, he's so, he's, he's so this, he's so that, you know what I mean? And it's like, dude, you were just the same fucker that was telling me uh, so-and-so deserved my ride. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so I don't know, man, this, this sport is, I mean, any sport is like that, but I mean, it's hard to get your circle. You know what I mean? Mm. It's super hard to get your circle in here because everybody's talking about everybody. Nobody's minding their business. You know what I mean? And and that's just that's just the sport, unfortunately. So it's it's gonna be hard for anybody to get over those little things. But at the end of the day, I honestly just think it's a part of what we do, bro. For one hundred percent, man. Like I think there's definitely a point. Um, and I mean, this is just me talking about my own experience, but I think there's definitely a point where like, if you want to be successful, so for me, it's like this podcast deal, right? And I've got bigger aspirations Mm -hmm. than just this podcast. Like it's not shit I talk about, but it's like, I got an Mm -hmm. idea of what success looks like for me in my life. And I want to enjoy the process of trying to get there and to get there. Like there's just a point where you have to like, not give a fuck 
about what people say yeah. and about what people think because mm-hmm. it's like who are you doing this for dude are you doing this for Julie yeah. Swole or are you doing this for the media dudes like because if you're doing mm-hmm. this for the media dudes then yeah I mean then you're probably gonna have to fucking you know make some excuses or explain why this happened or you know like tell your side mm-hmm. of the story or if you're doing it for Jalik Swole, it's just like, it gives a fuck. Like, I ain't doing this for you, bro. Like, I, yeah. I, I know what I'm yeah. about to do in this in this shit. And I definitely think that... Exactly. Like, for me, there was a point where, like, YouTube comments, dude, like, used to fuck me up big time. And, mm-hmm. you know, like, you'd see mm-hmm. a forum thread on Vital, and then you'd read what people said, and I'd, like, really take that shit personally and, like, really take it to heart. And I remember the fir- there was, like, mm-hmm. this one video that i put out with chad reed and i was like super excited i was like dude i'm doing a fucking podcast with chad reed like so many people are gonna watch this thing like (laughs) this is gonna be the biggest one i've ever done Mm -hmm. and then i put the shit up on youtube and i just had like literally a thousand comments of people saying as a fucking idiot and i was just like god damn (laughs) dude like that that sucks man like that was the biggest l for me it Mm -hmm. felt like and uh yeah. but it's like if you keep if you stay in a place where you care about that like there's a ceiling man and mm. you're gonna jump and it's gonna you're down, gonna hit your quick. head yeah a hundred percent so i think that yeah there's just a point exactly. where like if you want to be successful at something like there's a lot of stuff you got to stop giving a fuck about in a way yeah literally like um i know like even after the high point deal like I always have, obviously I have my comments that are like, oh, fuck (laughs) you. If it wasn't for RJ, if it wasn't for RJ, you know what I mean? And like, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have won that moto if RJ didn't go out, but a two, three finish is still fucking great. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, I I was, I used to get caught up in all that shit. Like even after Tampa, like my comments went crazy with all kinds of people talking shit and saying, oh, you fucking suck. And all those types of negative comments and like fuck like it's hard not to look at that shit when you know what i mean when it's right there like you just you want to know what people are saying about you and shit and like obviously all the media and all that and like right now i got to a point where i'm like like you're saying like i'm doing this for myself i'm not doing this for anybody else and it's like that's why I carry myself in a way that I'm trying to steer away from being a cookie cutter. Cause I'm not a cookie cutter. Like yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm different from a lot of these guys in Supercross, and I'm going to carry myself how I'm going to carry myself. I'm going to talk on cameras. If there's not a camera, just because all the other kids talk exactly like me and, and cuss like me just off of camera. Cause they're yeah. scared of what the outside perception is, you know? And like, that's not me you know what I mean and like I just I like to be myself and and do what I want and I comment back to people now and I talk shit back because I think it's hilarious I think it's funny you know what I mean like I'm just myself and and that's who I am you know what I mean like I, I like to troll back I like to talk just as if it's just me and the boys like um obviously I know when to be serious and whatnot but like uh, I'm, I'm me, you know? And like, I think it took all of that first year for me to finally get here. You know what I mean? I finally feel like I'm myself and like, it's a really, really like great feeling, like being able to be like, you know, you lay down in, in bed at night and you're like, no regrets. Yeah, dude. Man, honestly, my favorite, hey, Jet Lawrence, it's my fucking boy. My favorite moment of this outdoor season yeah. was you winning at High Point. This is my favorite, like, favorite 2021 moment of Supergrass and Motocross, whole yeah. fucking deal. You getting on the podium and going, let's fucking go. I thought that was <laughs> the dopest shit of the entire year that one moment and it wasn't a pass it wasn't a race win it wasn't jet winning the championship it wasn't because yeah i just looked at you and i go fuck that is real that is as real as a motherfucker can get right now like that's exactly how you should feel when you win your first race dude and especially Mm -hmm. especially after everything that that you've been through you know and it's like 
dude, that is what we need to see in this sport is like someone that's just going to yeah. let it fly. Yeah, I think uh, I think more and more and more the personalities will start to fly. I think uh, I think the whole motion of, of cookie cutter just comes from that's how everybody's kind of been, you know what yeah. I mean, for so long in, in a way in the sport. And we've gone away from everybody having their own personality, everybody being who they are. But uh, I think with how I am and obviously like, jet is who he is and, yeah. and everything like that I, th- I think the future is is pretty like bright in terms of flipping the narrative of motocross and and actually giving people uh people to actually look forward to watching you know yeah. what i mean like yeah a lot of these guys get on the podium and they're like oh yeah like great moto got a good start so then thank their sponsors you know what i mean and like yeah i go off of emotions and like just like I'm high energy and, and, uh, I think, I think moto is in moto and SX is in a, is in a good spot for like the younger guys coming up. I think we'll flip the narrative. Oh man, I, I completely agree. And I think you're one of the boys that's leading the charge in the, in that, in that lane, you know? And I mean, to, to speak on what we we're talking about before, like you, you mentioned little Uzi Vert, right? And it's like, I fucking hate yeah. that dude's music. There's a couple songs that yeah. absolutely <laughs> clap, like just that, that, like that dude's made some amazing songs, but 99% of it is yeah. dog shit to, to me, right? Should, <laughs> should yeah. he, wait, should he give a fuck about what I think? No way, dude. You know, like there's no, there's in yeah. no, in no lane ever should that guy give a fuck about what I think. And, you know, you look at that guy, mm-hmm. like so confidently just like as cliche as it sounds just living his best life that's just him that's who he feels no one's gonna Mm -hmm. that's how he feels no one's gonna put him in a box and then that hits dude like that that resonates so much because you can see Mm -hmm. in you can see that that person like i might not like his music but i respect the fuck out of that guy because he's going out there and he's just completely being himself like and you know i think the it's funny you were saying about like uh you know swearing or cussing or whatever that's one of the comments Mm -hmm. i get all the time like does he have to cuss so much and it's like this is just how i talk yeah like i grew up in a Mm -hmm. i grew up in a gnarly place like this is how everyone around me spoke and it's like at some point you know the the people make the argument of like what about the kids listening it's like okay well a kid doesn't cuss Mm -hmm. until he's about 12 so i'm gonna what I'm gonna yeah. not. I'm gonna not cuss on my I show. I can guarantee and- anything that kid is hearing in the outside world or at school where you think he's like protected is yeah. ten times worse than the few cuss words you hear on the podcast, and especially on like Xbox and PlayStation. Cause I know as a kid, I, I had people talking crazy amount of shit to me, and I was like, <laughs> "That's a word." So yeah, like. Bro. I, yeah, kids, kids, kids are open, especially with how like social media is now, like, like kids are just, it's too easy to access absolutely anything they want to access. So like, yeah. I, I think the whole swearing narrative is, is just, stu- it's stupid. Honestly, it's like, it's such a like old minded thing to say, yeah. you know what I mean? Like a cuss word is not going to change your kid's life or make him just say it like i don't, I don't know oh i totally it, get it. And, <laughs> and that's hey. that's picky because you have those keyboard warriors that go crazy over this stuff and i had i had people say this about i did a swap moto live interview and they're like geez like this kid's cussing like a sailor and i think i only said like one or two cuss words and i was like w-. and then I, I scroll a little more and they're like yeah what what would uh what would the team think if they seen him talking like that? And it's like, dude, you guys have been living under a rock for so long. And it's like, we need to get back to what motocross really is. Cause if people are caring about what you're saying more than like who you actually are, then like we're yeah. not in a good spot right now. Oh man, I agree. And the thing is, man, is, is like, if you don't want your kid to swear, like you should, you got to educate your kid. You got to be like, Hey, look at that Australian guy. Yeah. The way he the way he talks makes yeah. him look like an idiot. And I'm like and I'd sit mm-hmm. there and I'd go, "You know what? I probably agree. <laughs> like I probably am an idiot <laughs> and do look like an idiot." 
but it's like yeah. under no circumstances do you think that you're sheltering your kid or like by me cutting out you know yeah. swearing or my guests or whatever then that you're actually doing mm-hmm. anything to stop your kids swearing in the future like or like you said yeah. going on xbox and be like fuck get the fucking grenades fuck fuck like that's literally <laughs> what's going down every yeah. single time they that they yeah. go on xbox or school or or whatever it is but you know like i'd rather like if, if you're coming on here and you're like man this fucking race like this is the best thing ever or when you get on the podium you're like let's fucking go like you know what that just shows me is like oh i'm getting everything from him I'm getting all of that guy. There's yeah. nothing that he's holding yeah. back from me. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why, like, I've just never really felt the pressure. Like, it bums me out when people, you know, talk shit on me for that in a way. But it's like, I've yeah. never really felt It just takes pres- away from personality. Exactly. Like, I've just never really felt the pressure because it's like, hey, you're going to get all of Jalik's wall. Like, if you, if, if you drop a fuck in one of your sentences where you're talking about a race or something that was gnarly in your life or whatever, it's like, okay, I'm getting all of him. Like, he's being honest. He's being open. Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing that he's mm-hmm. holding back. And to me, I think that's, like, more important. And uh, one of the things that I was thinking before, like, you were talking about... It's kind of at the start when you were talking about losing your ride, and I'm I'm was sitting there thinking like, mm-hmm. you're way too fucking cool to lose your ride, bro. Like, there's just not that many kids <laughs> that are as cool as you. Like, there's a there's something in that. I mean, look at Dean Wilson. Dean Wilson is cool as fuck, mm-hmm. and we need Dean Wilson, yeah. and everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh. Nah, yeah, I, I, it's funny you bring up Dean because, like, for me, that was uh, that was who I got along with at Baker's. That's who I knew from uh, just, like, the little time I had riding at 83 and Timmy's uh, was, was him. He was always around. So when we went to Baker's, like, that's who – that's, like, we would literally get done with Supercross and, like, after struggling all day or whatever, he'd be like, he'd be like all right, yeah, gear up. We're, we're going back to the track and you're going to hit these whoops. 20 times and you're gonna hit him right and then we're gonna leave and that was like that's like the little shit that nobody sees like the behind the scenes like dean is a great person like dean helps me out with absolutely anything like i dude i walk into his house without even knocking like that's like that's my boy you know what i mean like he helped me with everything and like he is he's one of the best things that happened to the sport in a way just off his following and everything because like more people can see him being just like us, like just talking, talking whatever he wants, just just like it's just you and me, like on the camera, being who he is. And like that's something that the little kids now growing up, they'll be like, like I want to be a Dean Wilson. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't have to go out and win a race for people to care about him. You know what I mean? Because yeah. his personality and who he's made himself, his brand, everything, like he's – what a lot of people should be looking up to and not to say he's not like anything. Cause like he, he's, he's like a really good rider. You know what I yeah, mean? Like yeah, yeah. he'll, he has the potential to go out and win whenever the hell he wants to, you know what I mean? But it's just like more people need to like cherish that yes. those types of riders while they're here. You know what I mean? Like these riders yep. aren't, we, we have usually eight to eight to 10 years at most really. And it's like, people just take for granted everything and that's why you see Stuart leaves or ricky and dungy and philpoto i'm like oh they left way too early we like i miss those days and you know what i mean and they don't think like that until they're gone yeah so it's like a lot of uh, people should get back to cherishing like who we have you know oh man for sure and like the it's so cool that you know you're so young in in this sport and like your career but you've got this insight and it makes me excited as a fan to to watch you know what's like what's gonna happen with you and like how much fun we can have like being a Jalik Swole fan mm-hmm. and you know you look at like yeah. Phil Poto right now dude Poto's the fucking man right now just like smoking meats <laughs> at the track and drinking beers and riding vintage <laughs> bike, you know like yeah. where was that guy like i would love to have had that yeah. dude around and like and and i know dunge didn't really feel like uh 
there was much room for him to kind of like be this you know personable sort of guy or whatever he wanted to be yeah and it's like Mm -hmm. i i think now like you look at you know that epic career that that villo had and it's just like i wish we saw that and you know you i i was never around the baker's factory uh when rv was there but it's like you hear all those stories mm-hmm. of those two it's like there was a lot of cool shit going down but for whatever reason you know like mm-hmm. they just didn't yeah they didn't feel like they were able to like show that side of them yeah it, th- and that's just one of the parts of the sports that unfortunately i don't think we're ever going to get a- away from to be honest with you like yeah like that rv you see now is was probably him all along yeah yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? and that's yeah. who he was even when he was a champion but like if he were were to be like that then that whole narrative of like, oh, he he's mentally there and he he's a champ, like all that stuff starts to shift because like, oh, he's not even taking it serious. Yeah. And that's what the riders that that's why we're all almost almost all in a shell is because like, if if we go out and we have some fun or or like we bring you guys along on whatever a vlog or whatever you you know what I mean our personal stuff, like that narrative is gonna be is is this guy serious like is this what factory riders do and you know what i mean like and then like he's not taking it serious and and at the end of the day teams want results and like you can be like that and get away with it for as long as you're winning but as soon as you don't win they're chopping block they're like all right get him out of here this guy's you know what i mean yeah that's just unfortunately the narrative that is driven throughout motocross you know what i mean like you look like you're having too much fun oh he's not taking it serious yeah for sure man what sports then are you looking at that give you inspiration like what athletes do you look up to in uh in that way um man um i don't know i i mean it, it's 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 hard i mean I, I i'm like i'm a big basketball fan i like basketball and i'm starting to kind of dabble into football but like they're so different and those guys make so much money like they, mm, none they of that stuff even matters yeah, and, yeah, and there's yeah. only so yeah they got yeah and like the the teams have who they, who they have and like they can't just be like we're done with this guy or and even if they don't want him, he gets traded to another team. Like, it's not like you're just out and you're yeah. out. You know what I mean? And so those guys have a different kind of cushion in a way to be exactly who they want because it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? And plus, basketball or football, not so much as football, but in basketball in a way, like, you go to the arena and you don't have a helmet on covering your face or or like you're not just all in gear or whatever like Mm. you're showing up in your own clothes and you know what i mean like that that's who you are like how you dress is who you are your personality Mm. is who you are and all that is on the court like none of that is hidden in a way you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and even in football you know what i mean like they walk up they don't have all their stuff on or whatever and um i don't know that's just the difference with 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 moto in all the other kinds of sports i feel like you know what i mean like we you don't really see much of us because we're always head to toe in something that has to do with the team you know what i mean yeah yeah. i mean most teams they don't even let you wear what you want to wear going up to check you have you have your pit shirt on you have your hat on and you know what i mean you have whatever colors match the team and you go to your rig you get ready and you go out you know what i mean yeah sure a lot of I'm sure a lot of fans don't even know what I look like or what whoever looks like just based off, oh, we know him by his number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and his whether team or not shirt. we've seen him on the podium or not. Yeah, a hundred percent. And his team shirt. Yeah. So that's the that's the barrier that we're in. So I don't even know if there's a way to really change that. Have you? Did you hear that? That's just what we're in. Did you hear the podcast with uh, Bogle? So when I spoke to Bogle and Colt, we talked about like the walk-ins. So I want to, um, yeah. I want to set like I mean they're already doing it. I just want to try and help if I can, um, but set up like a dope mm-hmm. backdrop and then have a spot where like a photographer where it's like from this time to this time at every supercross race you can do like a walkthrough and then mm-hmm. we have like photos and then yeah. every everyone gets their walkthrough fit because. 
the, it's it's cool man like i mean i got i got my style that i like to have and and i think it's cool to yeah. you know dress the way that i like to dress and there's some and shoes. it's who you are yeah there's like some shoes that i like and there's you know i got i like wearing xlts and you know like tight pants and that's mm-hmm. like that's my fucking that's my yeah. vibe and i got like my hair the way that it is and it's like it's cool man like i'm kind of expressing the like the way that i feel and i like to i don't i don't like to uh feel like i have to look a certain way and that's why i have like fucking crazy hair and shit so i'm like yeah. i don't have to dress anywhere i can do whatever i want and i think yeah. that you it it does make a difference and i think that yeah if we do this kind of shit where it's like you boys get to walk out in your clothes it's like dude hunter and jet have yeah. dope style like you have dope style the you know colt bogle they both have dope style like and but then you go so then you go to like plessinger and it's like that motherfucker will dress like a cowboy and you know we get like some <laughs> some cool dope like red bull buckle or something like that for him to wear on his mm-hmm. on his shit or like you know el hombre he's he's like pretty much he's like homeless skater vibes all the time and that's fucking dope too you know like you yeah you ain't, you ain't gonna see yeah. you ain't gonna see ando running some super expensive shit but like he's gonna look cool running like mm-hmm. probably a, like a, the zoomies type fit you know so it's like that that mm-hmm. shit yeah. is that shit's cool and it's like it gives you an idea of who the guys are and and even you know when daniel blair was on the podcast it was one of the coolest things that has been said on this podcast in terms of like practicality of like what could we do to help the sport and he said no helmets on the start line until the two minute board goes up all about it man Mm. all about it like that is that would be so cool to you know have something where it's mandatory like that where and you know like uh you guys talking on the start like i know you like to talk heaps of shit on the start line and it's like we should see Mm. that like that's you man that's that's like a really cool part of who you are Mm -hmm, exactly and uh yeah i mean we we have to start figuring out our ways around it and 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 start making kind of teams realize that like the sponsors are they're gonna get their shine like they're all over the jerseys they're all over the rig uh the helmet we say it after every race and uh i think we should start being more lenient in a way to like allow personalities because i think we're in a box with supercross just in terms of people just like the racers they don't care about the personalities yet because Mm. there are no personalities you know i think i mean as little as it is and and like you know much of an afterthought as it is but you know you show up and everybody's wearing their own fits or however they want to look before supercross and people are like they're tuned into it you know what i mean yeah yeah they would be like looking to see what people are wearing or and the no helmet thing they'd be looking for faces and and not just numbers and it would open up you know what i mean more and more people would get into this kind of stuff and uh (laughs) it's funny it's funny you're talking about that because uh before i got hurt i was planning on showing up to paula uh, I was going to dye my hair a bunch of crazy colors and show up in a Dennis Rodman Jersey as, dope, a, as a little walk in, like just dope. for fun. I was going to do that. And, uh, obviously those plans got shut down just off of the injury and stuff. But like, that's like the little stuff that I just feel like would be funny and just to mess it up. You know what I mean? Everybody's walking in their pit shirts and then here's me crazy hair, Dennis Rodman Jersey. And, and I still take this shit serious. You know what I mean? And, uh, I think that's the, that's the narrative we got to break away from is, is is not making it so much of like, uh, he doesn't care because he's having fun. You know what I mean? Like a smile, laughing, shit, talking, wearing what I want. All that stuff is a part of personality. And that's just who I am. That doesn't have anything to do with how I'm going to race. You know what I mean? What's the Rodman connect? You big Rodman fan? Uh, yeah. Uh, but this, this all came from, uh, rookie year when COVID happened, uh, we had nothing to do and the, uh, MJ story Uh, came out and I watched that whole documentary series and I love that shit. And, uh, like, I don't know. It was just something, it was just something about, I just, I thought it was so funny. Like this guy, right? Like, 
absolutely out there like as far as it gets nobody understands him yeah Yeah. nobody understands him he's kind of just in his own world and he shows up and does his job and plays hardest on the court and does all the dirty work and all that kind of stuff but it's like if you didn't know who he was like off the court you would think he was just you know, kind of besides his hair, take his hair out of it. But yeah. you just be like, oh, that's a that's a hardworking basketball player. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but yeah. But then put on what he is outside of the court, and then you're like, oh, all right, this guy's different. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, it like shook up the narrative. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like this guy is so out there and so crazy, but yet he's still putting in just as much work as everybody else. You know? Oh man, for sure. And and to go back to uh, a little bit before, right? So. Um, you were talking about when you're at the ferries and like you just no one could relate to you like there was no one i mean there was no one that looked like you there was no one that came from where you came from there was no one that was going through what you were going through like i mean you and evan would have been super tight and like his dad's right there and your dad's away and it's like on every Mm -hmm. level there's so much about you that people can't relate to and that like you probably don't yeah. want to just verbally express and it's like how do you express who you are and it's like the what you said about dennis rodman it's like that guy in his mind mm-hmm. like not many people could relate to him and what was going on inside yeah. his mind and who he felt like he was right and if exactly what you said man if that dude just dresses like every other basketball player you just be like, well, it's a pretty cool and hardworking basketball player, exactly what you said. But his yeah. way of like yeah. having people relate to who he actually was, a little bit of like the internal state on the external world is like, I'm a fucking mm-hmm. put a bull ring through my nose and run different hair colors every <laughs> time. And it's like, and that's like, I'll make Get these motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll make these motherfuckers understand <laughs> who I actually am. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just a form of expression. And, uh, yeah, like at the ferries, obviously, I was young, so I didn't know. I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't even realize the importance of having your own personality and looking your own way and everything like that. Like, I was focused on what I was focused on, and I, I, didn't, I didn't care about the social media deal. I didn't care about any of that. I wanted to get to where I wanted to get to, and that was it, and that was for my family and whatever. I didn't care about the outside stuff. But it's just like now that I'm actually here and, like, yeah. the I don't want to be bit. like all these other guys. Like, yeah, like I, um, the pressure, it's not off because I still have – tons of things I need to accomplish I, for me. I, I don't feel like yeah. I've even scraped the bottom of what I need to do, you know? Um, so like I have, th- I have that to keep me motivated and keep me going and feel like the pressure still on. And, and, uh, obviously <laughs> money goes quick. Like I, yeah, I want to make yeah. a lot of money and then eventually maybe one day I have the money to put my mom in a big house somewhere else. And you know what I mean? Have <laughs> a house for, each of my brothers and house for my grandma. I'm like, there's endless, there's, there's endless money to, to make. Like I, I have a lot of stuff to do. So the pressure of making money for my family and doing all that kind of stuff never left me. Um, but now that I'm here, I can just sit back and like realize like personal branding is like an actual thing. Like that's, that's a sport outside of the sport in a way. Mm. And, um, I want to just, get bigger and bigger and and uh yeah more people have my story and like you said like maybe this inspires another kid that's going through exactly what i went through and thinks that he has no way out even though it is going to be hard like you know what i mean there, there's a, there's a shot yeah and uh so that that's just kind of what where i'm at as of right now like and then also being around dean as much as i've been around like he has his youtube and he has so much different things going on and like there's so many benefits in being able to be marketable. Like there's so many different things that you can get into when you're marketable. So I just want to, I guess, be more marketable, just be more relatable. Uh, You know what I mean? Just kind of get my story more and more out. And the first step of that was working with Adam Idas because I wanted my story to get out after not talking about it for so long. And, 
uh, I think uh, with him, uh, him, me and him going forward and, and trying to get this docu-series done, um, I think it'll open a lot of eyes and uh, hopefully we can get to a uh, big streaming platform and uh, just open this sport up to more than just the sport. You know what I mean? I want mm-hmm. more people who, do, who don't even know what a dirt bike is, bro. And like yes. see it and be like, oh, this kid's, this kid's dope. His story's crazy. And now I'm going to watch this kid. Like I'm going to turn on motocross or supercross, even though I never have just because I know this kid's story and like, I want to follow it. You know what I mean? And like, there's, I think there's tons and tons and tons of people out there that we can reach and bring into the sport because as much as it feels big to us, it's super small in the outside real world. You know what I mean? You can walk down the sidewalk, say something about NBA and somebody's like, Oh really? Yeah. Like what, what player you like? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like Moto has a potential to be there. Like, you look at moto like dude we, we literally we're jumping huge obstacles where there's crashes like we're banging bars like there's drama like it's absolutely something you think would be huge right but it's not and a lot has to start flipping for the sport to get to where it needs to be and in light of that that means more revenue yeah and absolutely everything for everybody you know what yeah. i mean and yeah. that just starts with the riders and the teams and everybody kind of just being like all right let's go yeah dude uh did you watch the tiger woods thing that doco no yeah so that that doco was pretty pretty cool um and sort of for what you said too you know like you had this guy that um I mean, I think it come a lot from, from his dad, um, Earl Woods and Mm -hmm. the, the whole, like the first black golf player to win a major and that, like they really put that on their back and they put the sport on their back. Like that really came from Tiger, you know, like, and and I guess what Mm -hmm. you're sort of saying of like you wanting to tell your story and you wanting to kind of like, um, I guess have that sort of impact, like it's pretty rad to hear that man because i mean i feel like with uh with james like they wanted to avoid that narrative almost you know like and i completely get it like and and it wasn't the social media era like so we've never really had someone come come along that kind of like was open to that and embraced what they went through and because i mean i i think one of the things i think about with um with like the african-american community is dude look at like every city in america has like that a crew of boys that are just like wheeling dirt bikes through the street there's like a mm-hmm. huge yeah. culture man like a big big dirt mm-hmm. bike culture but they're really disconnected like they're yeah. just doing it on the streets and you got like i know you're ethical uh-huh. dude like you got meek mill that was like a massive part of that and you got like chino and those boys it's like you I, I honestly think like if a young black rider came along and really put like put that narrative on their back and said like, all right, mm-hmm. I want to be that voice for these guys and for this community and I want to yeah. be the guy that like helps bridge that. I actually think that like we're missing out on a huge fan base of people that would want to watch yeah. you race um just because like the Mm story is not being told like there hasn't been that tiger woods guy that said like hey i'm doing it i'm fucking damn near the only one i came from the same place you guys Mm -hmm. came from and i'm here and i'm fucking winning and it's pretty rad you know Mm -hmm. and it's like i really think that there's there's this huge untapped market of, of people that would love to follow this sport if they kind of i guess had the access and had the horse in the race you know like fucking i love watching formula one like because one of my friends is in there like mm-hmm. i've never really cared that yeah. much about it until I, I had a horse in the race you know and like i watch supercross mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so religiously it's because i've got fucking horses in that race i got boys that i want to follow and i care mm-hmm. about if they do good and uh yeah i i just i think mm-hmm. we're missing a huge segment and again it's like 
it's not about like race it's not like we want more black kids racing motocross we just want more kids yeah. racing motocross we want more of yeah. everyone and whether it's like you know bogle and colt like it's to me it seems crazy that colt nichols can win a supercross champion be a fucking cherokee indian like that's the most badass shit of mm-hmm. all time like a fucking cherokee indian won a supercross championship this year <laughs> and it's like that didn't get mentioned yeah. one time and it's like people want to i guess mm-hmm. I, I guess i get it you know if people want to stay away from that topic but it's like there's nothing political about yeah. that there's nothing there's no like yeah. weird statement about that that's a fact like that's the bloodline of that yeah. guy like and that's fucking badass it's so unique and it's mm-hmm. so rare and it's like if you're a kid that's uh uh uh, uh you know first nation kid that wants to see the broadcast and you hear that like colt nichols is a, you know cherokee indian you if you don't know that that's what mm-hmm. happened if you don't know that that's where he came from and you're that kid that's sitting there you might never make that connection you might never have that spark that comes to your yeah. mind like holy fuck maybe i could race dirt bikes like maybe there's something in this blood <laughs> that you know maybe there's something in this blood that fucking you know makes a set of supercross whoops not that gnarly yeah yeah Nah, nah, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't even know that he was Indian until you had it on your podcast, like, with Isn't that Bogle crazy? you guys were talking about it, because, yeah, because I know after you DM me and told me, uh, I was mentioned, I had watched it, and, uh, yeah, like, you guys talking about the whole Indian roots and all that kind of stuff, I was like, I, like, I, I just, I never knew that, so it's like, yeah, th- those are the little things in Moto that aren't talked about, because I, I, I just... I feel like race is, is such a such a touchy topic when it comes like there's a lot of closed minded people in moto that still think what you know what I mean they they think like an old fashioned way and and they don't want to talk about the race because they think if you bring up race it's just like it, it's it's political you know yeah, yeah but in reality you know what I mean it's just it's just a reality of, of yeah, sport yeah, now. Like yeah. it's, it's starting to expand. Then you got Joe, who's from Japan, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, me, Mookie, and um, <laughs> you got the Indians, and yeah. and like yeah, I mean it's just it's starting to expand, and or I, I mean I don't even know if it's starting to expand, but we're starting to talk about the little yeah. things that yeah. makes everyone who they are, and ultimately it's just building the sport. Yeah, and, and you know, like I posted that video, and I felt I felt a little bit weird about it, to be honest. Um, but mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. I guess it's one of those things where I was I I was down for a little bit of pushback, or like I was down to have shitty comments because yeah. I kind of believed in what I yeah. said, I guess. But like to me, yeah. I, I ain't trying to start drama. There's no, sh- it's not shit no. talking. It's not like I got no. I don't look at it even as a negative. It's just like, hey, this is just like some cool storylines we don't talk about. Like, let's just talk about yeah. it. And I, yeah. and I've, like I, yeah. I said at the start, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that race matters. I should have said culture matters because it's like you come from a different culture. Yeah. Like, there's a different background there. And it's no different mm-hmm. to talking about Joe Schmoda coming from japan like there's a japanese culture that's yeah. there and it's like jet coming from australia mm-hmm. there's an australian culture there and it's like there's an african-american mm-hmm. culture there's a native american culture they're all you know we're all the mm-hmm. same shit we're all fucking people but these cultures like you could talk yeah. to me about my culture and my australian heritage and where i came from and like the yeah. way that i grew up and like that's that would be foreign to you you know like there'd be some common common yeah. ground in there but like there's a bunch of shit that mm-hmm. you just wouldn't experience and it's like i fucking enjoy yeah. hearing about you know the way it's like gnarly what you went through as a kid but it's like damn i respect the fuck out of you for going through what you did and then ending up here and then you know now hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to this and it's like who knows who gets inspired by that like that's a beautiful thing and i and i don't think like why why should we have to not talk about it because of whoever the fuck's reason where it's like i mean i don't really see a negative that's coming from this conversation right now yeah i mean yeah and obviously i don't either and um it's just 
it's just one of those things like you'll you'll honestly probably get shitty comments about this and like it's just you're not gonna please everybody and um and I've and that's one of the things where I've started to be better at is like I don't even care what people say anymore like you can say something 10 different ways and equal up with the same number of people talking the same shit saying you didn't say it the right way or whatever and this is I feel like this is completely harmless me personally I don't I don't find like talking about race being such an issue you know what I mean I think like motocross is motocross or supercross is it's it's like you were saying like it, it's a bunch of cultures in it right now that are just all trying to get to the same point and that's the top spot of the podium and yeah uh i think it's just all a part of the sport growing like every single sport has absolutely every single race in it and yeah. it's not a huge deal to talk about it you know what i mean and um it, like i don't know it's just it's just a touchy subject i mean for any any sport still like I feel like any sport still has theirs their issues when it comes down to talking about the kind of stuff and I don't know what it is that drives people to the point of like just like being so close-minded and and cutting mm. it off right away or or what but it is just unfortunately like the world we live in and it is what it is at the at the end of the day like I feel like if you're proud and happy about the questions or whatever you talked about that's you, you know what I mean? And that's just somebody else who's, you know, not happy in their own skin that have to come on here and talk shit about what you're doing with your own mm. podcast and what we're talking about just cause maybe they're not comfortable in their own skin in a way, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's just, there's so many different things that can come out of it from someone being so close minded. You know what I mean? That like, yeah you might, you just will never know why people are the way they are. And, um, obviously I, I don't think race is that big of a deal. Like I don't really like, I know why you talk about race, right? Like we're trying to like build up everybody, build up the personalities and absolutely like everything that everybody's come from and everything. And I'm the type of person where I, I personally, I look at everybody the same, honestly, like, uh, you can look at somebody and know they're a different race, but like, I don't, I don't really see it as such a different yeah. race thing. Like, I don't really, I don't really care to be honest with you. You're just another human to me in a way, you know? And I feel like that's how a lot of people should think of it. And so when you have someone like you shedding light on different things and just talking about the untalked about, I feel like people should honestly just be grateful that they're hearing different sides of stories. You know what I mean? Like this, this stuff doesn't is it talked about every day in our sport, and um, I think I think it's a good start for people to start being more just open to the the fact of like how different our sport is becoming in a way. You know what I mean? And it's like it, that we're all like we all come from these different backgrounds and these different places and these yeah. different starts in life. And man, people. The other thing that people are kind of real weird about that i see like through the comment section like the perfect example would be uh the clip that we posted of like the raha axel thing you know it was like uh Berriman was uh-huh. talking about raha and axel and there were so many people that commented on that video being like well axel's fucking come from a rich family and colby's done it th- the hard way yeah. and it's like yeah Okay, so let me get this straight. There's no right way. But the, the, these people are, are seeming to think that because Axel did it easier in their mind that he's mm-hmm. not worth as much. But I always wonder, I'm like, yeah. I go back to, I'm like, hey, Axel didn't have a choice of who his parents were. It's not like, it's not <laughs> yeah, like, it's not exactly. like there was some fucking like start, like pre-start line where they were like the staging area for your life. 
and uh, <laughs> and then Axel gets the choice of like a rich family in San Diego yeah. or like a not so rich family and it's not like Jalik Swall's like hey man do you want to be like a rich white kid or do you want to be uh, growing up as a poor black kid and you were like nah let's have a fucking challenge I want to be a poor black kid and Axel wasn't like you know what I feel like I feel like I want to kind of take the easy way and I want to be the rich kid it's mm. the most retarded argument that anybody could make saying that like this person had it easier than this person this, everyone had it the like everyone just got what they got we just got given these fucking cards yeah. and if axel does what he does with the hand that he was dealt good on him raha did what he did fucking yeah. good on him jalik swall did what he did fucking good on him at every point along each of those stories there's like crazy human struggle and it's like just because you're born fucking mm. you know you might be born well off that does not guarantee you success in life what that does is it yeah it gives you these challenges of like not really having to work real hard you know and it's like yeah just as easy to be a fuck up if you're from a rich family as if you're from a poor mm-hmm. family and it's like for you that's dude, not like, easier yeah for sure man you could have gone either way you could have fucking you could have been around the shit that you're around in the neighborhood you could have wanted to fucking make sure you had guns around all the time or you could have fucking wanted to like join a gang you could have wanted to do all the fucking all the cliche shit that you hear about and it's like axel could have done all the cliche yeah. fucking rich white kid shit that you hear about it's like <laughs> you can't people yeah. don't choose their fucking start line in life like it's not a conversation worth having and i replied to a few comments on there i was mm-hmm. like this isn't worth talking about Axel isn't some fucking rich yeah. kid that got handed everything. Like you don't learn, you don't do an alley oop on a fucking four fifty because you're rich. Hmm. Yeah, and that's why I don't. I never talked about a lot of things I talked about or talked about today because I just feel like, you know, like no matter what I say or whatever, like to the next person, it could come off as like, oh, he's he's just you know what I mean? Like Look at the it sympathy can be, and it's like it a point. Yeah. Yeah, ex- exactly. And that's not, that's not who I am. It's not whatever. And then also when I talk about like the other kids, like talking about Moto when I'm explaining whatever, I'm just explaining off like my raw feelings. I'm, I don't have anything against mm. the next kid who had a complete different life than me. I have, I don't like, I don't care. I don't really see anybody any different. I know, uh, like a bratty kid that doesn't take anything for, you know what I mean? Like he takes everything for granted. I meant, I, I can, I can see that just because I'm the complete opposite. You know what I mean? Like I, I can read a character pretty good, but I never wanted to come off as that kid who's like, Oh, I had it so much harder than everybody else. And, and you guys like, look at me, look at me. Like I don't have what these kids have. Like that's, that's never what I've tried to be. And then, and then like, I remember, uh, after high point, I, I went on Cooksey media's thing and was kind of just like giving him shit because he was one of the people who were saying I didn't deserve anything back in Tampa. So I went on there and was kind of just talking a little shit. And then we dabbled into the like dad thing again, just a tiny bit. And then I, I looked in the comments, like literally just like, I was like scrolling through YouTube trying to go down and it just like happened to go into the comments. And then I was in there and then like the first thing I see is like, Oh, he's just trying to make everybody feel bad for him or whatever. Like, like his, his dad is a piece of whatever. And like his dad did what he did and, and like he doesn't deserve whatever for it. And like, that's like the type of shit where it's like, that makes me not give a shit about talking about whatever. Cause like, yeah, you have someone who comes from a complete different background and they're like, like they don't look at it as in like my dad absolutely sacrificed everything because he had nothing. He grew up from nothing. He wanted me to not be where mm. he is at or what he was doing. He wants me to make it out and be something for myself. People don't look at that kind of shit. They look at, oh, he did the wrong thing. He didn't do the society's pet way of living and worked his nine to five and whatever. And like, they're like, Oh, he, he went, he went in and like, fuck that kid. you know what I mean? Like his dad was doing fucked up shit and his dad deserves that shit and he doesn't deserve his ride. He didn't deserve that. That's what people talk like. And like, 
though that was the narrative that's like that's why i didn't talk in yeah. in this community in a way you know what i mean because it's like a lot of these moto kids are uh just normal guys following the sport like most of them probably didn't they ha- had nothing to do with anything that i talked about in my life you know what i mean so yeah. they have a complete different background and so they see my story and they're like fuck this kid you yeah. know what i mean yeah. like he doesn't deserve shit and that's the type of shit when like I was younger. I didn't want to deal with that. You know what I mean? Now I'm in a comfortable spot where I don't really give a shit what people say. Right. Like yeah. you can judge me. You can talk shit about me. You can say my dad ain't worth shit, but I know my, a lot of people would trade in their dad for my dad in a heartbeat on what like my dad was willing to do for me and how much he cared about me and the family and how much he would sacrifice. So that's, uh, it's just, part of the world we live in and in a way you know what i mean like everybody takes what they want out of whatever and it goes back to your axel hodges colby raha thing like they're gonna talk shit about axel because he came from something that they didn't come from you Mm. know what i mean so there is no right way like there's no right way at all in anything even with the race thing like it goes back to everything yeah man and but i mean i i definitely like that was something that frustrated me because i was just like what like I, if if you have that opinion, like so, if you're a person that can watch that video that I spoke about, of like Barryman talking about the Colby and Axel beef, right? If you're a person mm-hmm. that can make that kind of comment, or if you're a person that can make a comment of like Julie's da- dad's a piece of shit, okay, you're actually a piece of shit. Like you should not want to be that person. Like you shouldn't want to be the kind of person that leaves hate on a video like that is a direct reflection of like of what that person is like and the thing is man it's like you can't even be mad at those people because again they didn't choose their parents they didn't choose how they were raised they didn't choose the shit that they were given in life to like help deal with circumstance so you just got to kind of feel sorry for those people and just like hope that you know they can change their mind and <clears throat> that's why you know that's why i kind of do feel like it's important to have these conversations that you know because yeah you get new in- that's one of the good things about being a human you can get new information that can change your mind and then you can live from mm-hmm. that place and you know I, I guess part of part of this whole thing with this um for me is like a uh, at least I can try and give people some perspective, really let people see behind the curtain of like what you actually went through and what it was like. And, and then hopefully that becomes like yeah. new information that other people can then go like, ah, oh, fuck, I was actually kind of wrong, dude. Like I kind of fucked up in mm-hmm. thinking that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Like I know exactly what you're talking about, but that's just, I just never cared to like try to flip that narrative. Like I just let people think what they think and I went about my way. I think I was honestly just so focused in what I was doing. Like I was saying, like all the years yeah. flew past and all that kind of stuff that I literally just, I just literally just left it alone. And like that, yeah, I mean, I can, I can just feel sorry for myself all day if I just went off of yeah, yeah. What, what I was, what people said about me and Moto coming up or uh, just what they say now or whatever. Like I, I had all kinds of stuff like said to me and amateurs and all that kind of stuff growing up where it was like, like right when my dad went in and it was just like, I didn't care. I just, I had the people around me that were around me and I'm where I'm at now from it. Yeah. I fucking love it, dude. I got a lot of respect for you. And I mean, I'm a 33 year old man and I look up to you, you know? So I think that that there's something that's super, super fucking cool, uh, in that. So anyway, we will leave that stuff. Let's do some bench racing real quick. Today is the day that fucking every Insta post drops about who's going where, (laughs) who's doing what Jason Anderson to Kawasaki. Give me your thoughts. Uh, man, I'm just, I'm just happy to see everybody make the moves that they thought was for them, right? Like, obviously, it sucks to see uh, Jason leave Husky, and 
uh, he was always around when I was around and like I went all to all the races when I was on super minis and 125s or whatever and we watch all the guys with uh, Hewitt and everything so like I was always around Jason and like yeah it does suck to see someone who you're like used to leave and somebody who's like such a free spirit and so chill and and like understanding of what's going on around him but it's like at the end of the day like he made a decision for himself that he thought was his best move and I'm sure he's happy with and uh it's it's cool to see you know what I mean and like for the sport it's sick like there's gonna be a bunch of new people that were like tuned out because everything was the same for so long that's gonna come back and be like so many new people on new different bikes like this is sick you know so like I think it's gonna be uh I think it's gonna be a fun season for a lot of people coming in like seeing new bikes new colors and also uh the signing of Mookie it's funny like the life full circle thing like this is the guy that was uh, helping me out through all the, my bad times. And then, like, now we're on the same team, you know? It's just Dude, funny I to see, even, like, I hadn't even life thought of that. Full circle. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Like, I, I mean, I haven't either, but it's like you mentioned that, and then I start thinking about it, and it's, it's sick. And then, obviously, uh, I'm really close with Dean. So, like, just to have, like, everybody who I'm close with pretty much on the same team, like, it's pretty sick. It's going to be a fun environment. I'm actually looking forward to uh, what the season has to offer, and especially with all the new boys. So um, Malcolm's going to be at Alden's, right? Yeah. How's that going to go? Uh, I think it'll go really good. I think he's, he's going to have the structure he needs. I think uh, he's going to have a bike that fits him that works really well. Um, and obviously Alden hasn't done any wrong in a way, you know what I mean? Like yeah, he, he's yeah. really, he's made a bunch of champions. You have your guys that came into Bakers and it didn't really work out, but that is what it is. That's Moto. Yeah. So I think, I think Malcolm is in for a good year based off of just, I see him. He's, he's really focused. He's uh, happy to be where he's at. Uh, and like, that's one of the main things on racing is like t- your mentality on everything is kind of what you're going to do. You know, like he's happy. He's got a new team, fresh start out and behind him. Like, believe it or not, like you, you go to Baker's and there is no question mark on like, what are, what are those guys doing over there? It's so, mm-hmm. it, it feels like it's so like secretive. You know what I mean? Like you get that confidence of knowing like, Oh, I'm doing absolutely everything that the past champions were doing. And Let's go to war. You know what I mean? So I think uh, the confidence of Bakers, um, obviously him taking training really serious and um, all that good stuff. I think he's in for a good good year. And then obviously, I mean, he just came off of – he podiumed the last round of SX. So, like, you know it's there. You know what I mean? And uh, I think uh, if, if all the cards play right, obviously, and good starts, I think uh, you'll see a lot of the uh, 27. Man – that I've seen that dude do some shit on a bike that's just fucking insane. Like, there's not many people <laughs> on the yeah. planet that can ride a bike as good as Mookie. Or go through the whoops. <laughs> yeah, man, there's some uh, no, there's, I, there's some uh, crazy crazy I've, Stuart I've shit. I've had going a bunch of people that are like, "Hey, go to Stewart's, go to Stewart's and and train on whoops." I'm like, dude. <laughs> those fuckers don't care to die in those things, dude. I kind of care. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> the way he hits whoops is like no regard for life. You know what I mean? Dude, I got this footage. I would love to try and dig through my hard drives. I should try and do it and find this footage. I film, you know, those like phantom flex cameras, those cameras that are like 1500 frames per yeah. second. So we were filming, yeah. we were filming mm-hmm. Mookie through the whoops in that. And uh, he's like, it was like the test tractor was beat to shit. And uh, he's just going like, do, mm-hmm. do, 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 just started going, mm-hmm. right? And then he fucking hit the the table, uh, the tabletop of the step on, step off and just launched, dude, like mm-hmm. fucking sideways, completely jumped the whole lane across, landed and then skidded and then stopped before the fence. It was like... <laughs> the biggest non-crash you've ever seen in your life, man. I was just like, I actually have no idea how you've done that. <laughs> that's uh, that's just a normal Monday for me. 
Yeah, that's just straight. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, I mean it is insane. It, it I think it's uh, it's funny too, like when you see guys in Supercross, right? Like regardless who they are, like say a Mac do, right? Like they have a huge, huge offset in the bike, and like it's kind of crazy when you watch. Every, like I don't know if you've actually like pause their slowed down saves but like it's actually kind of crazy how natural like y- your brain works for you to like correct something super fast like half the time you don't you don't you don't realize everything's going on but like i've had times where i've almost crashed and it's been on video and i go back and look at it, i'm like holy shit i did that you know what i mean and it's like it's kind of crazy how just like just it, it works out you know what i mean just self of like mentally just like shifting super quick and all that kind of stuff and then like what i was about to say is like these people on supercross when you see the sx replays and like you see guys who probably don't even really realize what they did or how they did it or if even if they had the skill to bring back what they did but it's like it's funny to see how that all works out in a way you know what i mean like you yeah, don't then, ever even know that you have the skill to do that kind of stuff but it just happens. oh yeah and then that that's what makes a guy like tim ferry crazy when he can like break down everything you know it's like how how do you every single you don't thing. even know like how do you know what you're doing when it's just like so in the moment so split second it's like how do you <laughs> how do you know that yeah i've had times where i've told him like either over the phone or a text or whatever i'm like oh i went down and he's like oh like what part of the track kind of deal and then i tell him and he's like oh uh and he'll just like say some stuff where it's like you probably fell because you did that and i'm like motherfucker i did he's seen a video yeah i was like yeah i was like he's seen a video there ain't no way he's like because it was a big thing for me because i would never use my front brake in turns like you know how you can kind of drag your front brake and the front wheel will stay down and track yeah and uh i'd have times where i would just wash the front or tuck the front all the time just off of not having that traction and like i'd tell him i'd be like yeah i fell oh how'd you fall and i'd be like i just tuck the front like not like something usual he'd be like Oh yeah, so you probably uh, came in, uh, only used back brake, got to the middle of the turn, and your forks just had no traction to give, huh? I'm like, no, I was, I was totally I using was the front brake. Sure. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you're tripping. Yeah, I was like, no, you're tripping. You don't know what you're talking about. But like the whole time, like I don't know. It's just, it's funny. Like, it goes back to what I was telling you. Like, he watched everything that I didn't think that he was watching. Yeah, to where, yeah, like, yeah. Now. I can just say something and he tell me what actually happened without even being there, you know? Motherfucker. Hey, I'm just going to piss real quick and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> All, All good. Right <laughs> yeah. What what up? I'm there? talking to your boy Jacob about Troy. Oh, really? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're just, we're bullshitting. Hey, I'm, I'm about it. Um, fuck dude, that hit me so quick. I was like, I am busting for a piss right now. <laughs> uh, all good, all good. All right, so we'll uh we've we've done three hours. We fucking blew through this shit. I uh yeah, man, I've Yeah, really... when you went to take a piss, Jacob came in and I was like, What what uh what time is it? And he was like, Oh, you guys been here for a fucking long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's sick, eh? Hey? Like I love just getting to sit in here and you just like lock in for a few hours yeah. and you just there's no like there's no uh well, first of all, there's no real questions, but there's just no like time limit on what you you know, if you talk about something for an hour, who gives a fuck? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm about to uh I'm about to go back home and set up my shit, right? And I'm gonna make you get on Xbox and we're gonna do a streaming. Oh, okay. So <laughs> yeah, what's what's I'm gonna what's, make you get on an Xbox, dude. Oh I'll, I'll I don't have one, I'll get one just so we can do it. What game are we playing? <laughs> uh fuck, I'll let you shoot the shot. But uh t- we're gonna stay off of the racing games because I, I cause too much shit on there. Yeah. Are you good? Of course. Okay, fair, fair. I, I feel you. I, 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 I got that energy. I got that energy. No, 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 no. I used to always beef. I used to always beef with kids on Supercross the game because I just like you race right, 
as a racer all the time, right? Like you're not trying to go out there and be dirty and shit. So when I get on a video game, my only mindset is taking fuckers out. <laughs> so I will just clean everybody and like everybody be like, oh, you're the swole kid? Fuck you. <laughs> 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 oh dude i love so that yeah shit. we're gonna stay off that because that causes too much beef so we'll do something else so what uh yeah what plans have you got like have you got some stuff in the works like you're talking about you know like the personality stuff and the you know like you you've got yeah. ideas like where are you at what, what's the plans mm. i'm getting i'm getting more and more into it like uh i'm i'm gonna eventually try to get a youtube going i want to get a youtube going and and i don't even care if it gets a lot of views or not like i just want to have the content out there of like the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that nobody really sees like like honestly riding is such a fun environment like especially yeah. when it's like with dean and, and mookie and, and all these guys that are all these different personalities and, and we're all just messing around and having a blast you know what i mean and that's stuff that people don't see and i kind of want to do more stuff around that i know everybody has their vlogs and and stuff like that but uh I feel like more personal content would be pretty sick to get into on YouTube. So I want to, I want to try to do that. And then, uh, uh, I have some works with, uh, Troy and, uh, I'm trying to get like some merch stuff going on and, yeah. um, all this stuff is, is just, is just plans right now, but, uh, yeah. they're starting to come to light and I want to, you know, I want to dabble into everything really. Like I want to, I want to get out there. Yeah, yeah. Nah, dude, you're one of the guys that can, can pull it off. I mean, I know Jet's killing it with his merch. Um, and the yeah, like yeah. the the content game is crazy. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna uh I'm gonna send you a podcast that that podcast I was talking about. Yeah. Uh I'll send you that. You uh -huh. should def you should definitely listen to that. Um Nice. And yeah, yeah, for sure I would. Yeah, I think that yeah, you just creating some real leverage for yourself, you know, like you look at a guy like Dean. Yeah with the following that he's got it's like he's really got this leverage within the sport where he's like this undeniable personality and it's like jet has created this crazy doesn't matter what himself. kind of year that guy has because yep. everybody loves him and he brings eyes to the team and sells bikes probably sells more bikes than a lot of guys who are winning right now oh yeah man 100 percent um so yeah no nah, that that's mm -hmm. rad that, that that's the headspace and I mean, the the reality of it is too, dude, is like you guys do get a lot of time to rest, you know, and resting can yeah. mean like sitting down and typing emails and, you know, getting your merch shit yeah. done and, and email. Like, it's not mm -hmm. like, it's not like you can't have an off switch. Like, dude, look at Ricardo. Like, have you seen his merch line? No, I haven't. Bro, do yourself a favor and go, I think it's like, <laughs> oh, fuck. I'll text you the link to it anyway, but like his merch, bro, is yeah. like super fucking rad, and he's like really hands on with it, and he's winning Formula One races. Uh -huh. So it's like if you want to be a G, yeah. you can be a G, or you know you could be the guy mm -hmm. that, like you said, locks yourself in a box, and, and it's like he's doing the work too, and he's still out mm -hmm. there winning. So it's like you know you can go, you can tick all your boxes. It's all laid out there for you with Alden. It's not like you got any yeah. guesswork of like, have I done the work? Oh yeah, I've done yeah i have done yeah. the work and then you yeah, just exactly. go and you know keep working you know yeah i want to i want to start to uh kind of get in between on the uh you know is he taking it serious and personal branding in a way yeah. you know what i mean like i know too much into that personal stuff can people think it's a, a distraction you know yeah. So I want to i want to get in between you know what i mean obviously i'm going to work my ass off um but also, I, w I just I want to do stuff for a lot of other people to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna for sure find my fine line on you know what I mean, like being myself, uh, having fun, and also making sure everybody knows that I'm dead ass serious and I'm putting in the work. Yeah, man, for sure. Fuck, dude, I appreciate this shit so much. Like, I've enjoyed this podcast with you oh, yeah. as much as I've enjoyed any that I've ever done. So I, uh, I really appreciate nice. you. You're dope as fuck, and uh, and I I hope that um, I hope shit works out with your dad too, man. I, I really I would fucking love to oh, see. Yeah. I'd love to see him at a race where you win. That would be. That would be. Oh no! Cool. Yeah, That'd we have see cool this. Moment. We have some big plans. People just gotta stay tuned on the uh on the atomized still we got 
big plans coming and uh we're trying to we're trying to we're trying to make something big out of my story and and uh open some eyes to motocross so yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be sick i'm i'm gonna we're gonna be into everything kind of on what you're saying to be honest with you we've been we've been on it so uh yeah i mean that's uh it's not something you'll have to you know hope for like i'm gonna have to uh I'm going to find my way to have everybody on that same kind of journey with me in a way. You know what I mean? I want to, yeah. I want to do it like that and get people invested. And also, yeah, I mean, uh, shout out to you for having this podcast. So I can come on and talk to you and have a blast for three hours without even knowing that it was three hours. You know what I mean? I, I watched your, uh, your stuff and I've been a fan for a while. So, uh, it's sick to finally be up on here and, you know, have the platform to talk with you. It's been a pleasure. Oh man, I appreciate it. And, and and yeah, I mean the show would be nothing without the people that are the guests. So all the uh all the credit mm-hmm. goes to to everyone that comes on. So I appreciate it, man. You're, you're a the fucking... voice behind the camera though, bud. Nah, you're man. a part of it. You the G, bro. You the G. <sighs> I uh yeah, <laughs> I can't I can't wait, man. Like I'm super excited to to watch next year and uh yeah, I'm fucking I'm here for it exactly thank you thank you i appreciate it i better be one of those horses in the races now i know i i watched one of your uh race streams before and i was i was not one of those horses which yeah dude and it was actually one of those races i've done good too actually and i didn't get much praise and i was a little tight with you (sighs) ah fuck all right i'll fix that i'll get that you know (laughs) you know most of the time when we're doing those streams i've got sam just being a complete fucking pain in my ass the whole time that i'm bet you know actually <laughs> no i'm not even gonna, this is the real excuse all right half the time when i'm doing those supercross yeah. companions i'm so worried that it's gonna crash because last year we had like the worst internet in the world and every <laughs> fucking race yeah. that we did i'm like this it probably isn't gonna work them that's like the most stressful day ever is doing those stupid supercross <laughs> companions and i do like two rounds into the series and i'm like fuck this why do we do this shit yeah <laughs> no but i think it, i think it's sick though it might be hard for you but i think i think of your thing it's actually pretty sick although like it would be cool to see the actual race while you guys yeah. are talking and, and like bullshitting about it and shit but like I think it's sick. I think uh, it's like it's entertaining and shit. Obviously, it's like you're watching with a bunch of your boys on the couch, right? Like that's essentially what it kind of feels like you guys are doing. I think it's sick. Well, we got uh, hopefully by the time Supercross comes around, we're gonna renovate this studio so it's a little yep. bit bigger. Hopefully, I'll be able mm-hmm. to buy some more equipment mm-hmm. that makes it a bit easier. Um, and dude, the other thing that I want to do as well, I want to have like a little booth that so like you guys can go so let's say you win the heat like well you're probably gonna win the first heat race next year so it's like you win the first heat race of the season and then it's like bam the helmet comes off and you just come and sit in the chair and fucking yeah. tell us all about it i feel yeah. like that, i feel like that that'd be, be so dope. sick yeah because we had like one yeah, of the that would be things, actually super sick well we had aj catanzaro do it uh from one of the rounds i think it was mm-hmm. one of the salt lake rounds he had like his uh, yeah. his film dude was there and like they set up so that he could call yeah. in after the race yeah. but that'd be pretty sick if mm-hmm. we could get like all the boys coming on and talking shit like midway through it nah, that would be sick yeah Is that'd it? be that'd be super sick that'd be something that people would tune into for sure especially right after the uh, race that that would be pretty big especially because I don't go to the races you know exactly yeah it makes <laughs> it even better right uh, <laughs> That's it. All right, bro. I'll let you get out of here. And uh, I think, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. What were you gonna say? No, I think uh, next time, next time we do uh, another podcast, dude. You need to invite all the boys. It'd be sick to have all your uh, guys that you're usually doing those like companions and shit with. It'd be kind of cool to do a full, full fledged podcast. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. Well, I mean, hopefully um the like the australian borders are opening pretty soon so like my plan is yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. get over there and then build like what i've got here mm-hmm. and build it there um yeah which would be fucking yeah. rad like because dude imagine me sam gl like a couple of boys watching super like this would be my ideal day yeah. right 
This was the funniest yeah. thing about Math has given me shit for like not going to the races. I was oh, like, Oh, I remember that. I yeah, remember that. Dude, I, I'm like does he not know that going to the races is way less fun than watching the fucking races in the podcast? <laughs> like, this is actually so Especially much Especially how you guys fun. do. Yeah, I was like, I actually kind of don't <laughs> want to go to the races. So, like, this would be the ideal way So, what me. was that? Why was that a beef? Oh, I don't know. He just said... Well, no. Well, because I am in Red Bull Moto Spy. And then he's just like, yeah. this guy mm-hmm. doesn't know anything about moto. And he doesn't go to any of the races, but he's commenting on the races. So that's was that's where it come from. But I was just like, so this yeah. this would be like, let's say I was in America, right? Studio was in Temecula. Yeah. I got a studio in Temecula. Mm-hmm. I would drive to Anaheim. I would watch all the practices, and then I would drive straight to the fucking studio with all the boys, and I would be <laughs> putting the race on the TV, and I would be live streaming it anyway. Because uh, that t- that is like the most fun way to watch Supercross, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, it's funny. I uh fucking Pulp always gives everybody shit. I I gave him some shit back at Thunder Valley after one of the races cuz he's fucking always running his mouth. Yeah, I mean, fuck it is what it is. It's what he's got to do. I actually went on there yeah. a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, that's sick. Did you really? Yeah, the How'd that go? Yeah, it was all right. I enjoyed it to be honest. I like I like fucking debating people. I I feel like oh no, yeah, exactly. And that's where I was at with Pulp too, because like I, I don't I don't care what he says, but it's it is funny for people to hear what he has to say and and then like the the clash back. You know what I mean? Because no riders usually come back at Mathis and give him any shit back. He just he's the only one with the platform that talks. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I thought it was funny to clap what do you, back at What did he say about you at Colorado? Uh, no, it was nothing at Colorado, but it was just like he, I get, I got a sixth at Colorado, and at the time that was my best finish because I've never really raced outdoors, and uh, I was just giving him shit because like never really gives me the time of day, never talks about me, no hype, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, he's in front of the Rockstar rig acting like, oh, yeah, this this kid, we all knew that he was going to be pretty good at that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, in all reality, it wasn't the case. And then, like, after Tampa, like I told you, I kept all our receipts. Everybody who talked shit, I knew <laughs> who talked shit. And uh, it was just for that time. So it was, like, it was so – it was so, I was just, like, fucking stoked. Like, finally, I can fucking – I can say some shit back to the guy who I know is just talking shit or did not care about me. And then all of a sudden now he's here. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so funny, dude. Well, hey, I didn't talk about you on Supercross Companion, <laughs> so I guess I'm no better. You can guarantee that I'll be pump- <laughs> uh, you can guarantee I'll be pumping up those tires. Yeah, I'm going to watch him back. We're going to fucking see about that. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, did I talk <laughs> shit on Jalik at any point? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, never, never. I was just messing with you. I, I mm. watched the one after Orlando 2, and I think Jet was on there with you as well. And then, yeah, that, I mean, that was it. I mean, you didn't really know me, so you're just like, oh, yeah, good ride for Swole. And that, that was it. So I was just messing with you. But I'm going to go back. I'm going to watch some shit. I'm gonna be like, motherfucker! I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna make like a swole highlight reel of all the times that I said you were rat. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, oh, you, like man. I said, you got you got co-signed from Wes Williams from day one, and like like I said, Wes is one of those guys where like I'd be fucked if it Verb wasn't West. for him. Yep, yep. So if Wes if Wes yeah, co-signs yeah, yeah. if Wes co-signs someone, then that's like just straight family. Yeah, no, that's sweet. That's sweet. And, and uh, yeah, he was one of the people who I feel like gave me uh, some notoriety on his stuff. You know, like he included me in a lot of the verb videos and verb pictures. And like at the time, that was the thing. Like after the race, you went on to the verb site to see if you made the verb site. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm like, it, it's stoked to have somebody like that who we're not even necessarily the closest, but like, you know what I mean? Like he he's given praise where I guess it's due, due in lack of other words or whatever. But uh, no, it's cool to see like guys like that just show me love when they absolutely didn't have to, and I wasn't the biggest at the time. And then also here we are with you, and you know me from him. So it's just like it's pretty it's pretty cool and a, a cool little like 360 in life. You yeah. know what I mean? To see that uh, all these kinds of things played out the way they did. 
Dude, I remember there was one, speaking of verb, I remember there was one gallery from Minio's where you were just scrubbing mm-hmm. the fuck out of everything and you just like, you had like the full elbow tuck scrubs going like, <laughs> that, and like the whole way through yeah. the gallery. There was like these Minio like full elbow tucks. I was like, fuck that kid's gangster. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I love it. I used to get a bunch of shit for it from Ferry, so I'm glad somebody appreciated the elbow tucks. <laughs> That's sick. All right, dude, I could talk to you all day, so you can get out of here. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll do, we'll do. All right, brother, I appreciate it once again, man. And um, Yeah, I'd say yeah, I'll put this out thank like you. Monday appreciate next week it. or something. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.